Good. Father Kim Barker, how are you doing? This is it. This um, is it. It's live. I'm doing fine. Thanks, Matt. I don't know if my accent has, is going to become stronger as yeah, we chat. As, as we talk, you might come back to ours. What do you think? Will I come back to Australia? In or, your speech. Yeah, what do you think? Do you think I've lost my accent? No, it's still there. You, I can tell you're an Aussie. Mm. Yeah. See, that's not. But you've good added enough. a bit of the American accent, I mm-hmm. think, too. You know, when I was in the states for four years, unfortunately, I picked up the American accent so much that when I got home, my family wanted to disown me. <laughs> but <laughs> my mum's a bit like that. She keeps saying, "You sound like a bloody Yank." <laughs> that's right. Not exactly. realizing there's this distinction in America between the Yanks and the you know yeah, that's right. the rest yeah. of the country. Sure. Mm. Yeah, it's so lovely to have you on. It's great to be here. I've yeah, got it really is great, um, great memories of 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 you and your religious order and different things we did in Australia. He's going to be walking around touching things. By the way, don't don't have to be worried. Yeah, and I've got to stop swiveling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should get like a little electric <laughs> shock button. That's right. Um, for those who are just tuning in and not sure who you are, who are you? Who am I? Who are you? <laughs> Well, I'm Father Ken Barker, um, and I'm a priest. I started off as a diocesan priest in 1974. I was mm-hmm. ordained. And um, even in journeying towards priesthood, um, that in itself was quite miraculous in my life because um, at the age of 19, I um, experienced a call. And at that stage, I didn't really know the Lord very personally, to tell you the truth, but I was still a practicing Catholic. But I just read a book uh, which was um, a book on a priest in China. And it, at the end of the reading the book, I thought, I'm meant to be a priest. It just came like that. So that's the first part of my identity. I just sort of knew I'm, I was meant to be a priest from the very beginning. And I didn't know how to do it, so I, I, I remembered a priest who was at my hometown, well, back in Canberra, rather. And um, so I, I made my way to Canberra, and I, this is the next day. I said to him, look, I've got to be a priest. He said, why don't you finish your university degree? Because I, you know, I had another, um, I think it was another year to go mm. in a science degree. So no, if I don't go now, I'll never go. So I ended up sort of before the bishop the same day. And the bishop said, why do you want to be a priest? I hadn't thought about why. <laughs> I just knew I had to be a priest. Uh, so it was a grace upon me that I wasn't even aware of in a way. Uh, and I, I, so I blurted out, I want to serve God and serve my fellow man. <laughs> And he said, that's good enough for me. <laughs> How soon can you get to the seminary? And I was in the seminary within a week. So yeah. what were you doing beforehand when you f- experienced this call on your life? I was Job-wise? Or? I was studying okay. uh, for a Bachelor of Science at Sydney University. And I was going to be a teacher, you know. I, I had no other uh, aspirations, really. <clears throat> so that was the first thing that happened. I got just that sort of initial calling uh, that gave me an assurance, and, and that was the time just after the council when there was a great amount of turmoil in the church as we were making the changes necessary, and the seminary was changing drastically. Mm. We started off with 38 guys, and only six of us ended up going through. But I never doubted. I never doubted that that was what God wanted of me. So I'm so grateful for that grace, a huge grace that he gave me, and I only got to know Jesus in the seminary. <laughs> I didn't know him beforehand, really, even though I was a practicing Catholic. Um, but um, I, I'd go before the Blessed Sacrament and just really experience his presence, where I'd be sort of like, you know, praying through the stations of the cross and I'd start weeping. So the Lord was starting to touch my heart. Mm. And after communion, especially, I'd sort of feel really the warmth of the Lord's love and his presence and everything. It was just so beautiful. So, yeah, that was a, the first step then, was just I'm, I'm, I'm a priest, you know. So I, I'm so grateful for that. Um, but then um, after being a priest for a couple of years, uh, I was got a bit disillusioned. Not sort of to the extent of wanting to throw in the priesthood, but thinking, is this all it is? You know, uh, uh, is that all it is? Uh, and so uh, it just so happened that the bishop asked me to go overseas and come to the United States. When you say, is this all it is, what were you encountering that you thought this isn't enough? Well, or not encountering. Well, I didn't quite know how to communicate the Lord. I, I, I don't think I was sufficiently in love with the Lord to be able to talk about him as my love. Mm. And, and so I was sort of like frustrated. I was in competition with another priest who was 
much better at preaching and much better at sort of communicating with people and everything like that. And I felt sort of inadequate in that regard. And, and so I was very diligent. I'd be around, I visited every house in the town, I think, you know. But then people would come out afterwards and say, oh, a lovely sermon, Father. Mm. I think, what's that mean, lovely sermon? <laughs> so I was feeling inadequate in being able to communicate. I sort of knew that I was meant to be, you know, a, a proclaimer of the Word of God. That I was meant to communicate the love of Jesus to people. So I really didn't know how to. And I didn't know sufficient. Uh, the Spirit wasn't moving sufficiently in my life. That was the point. So anyway, after having done study for four years here in Washington, D.C., um, coming back with a Ph.D., I thought, well, now I've got it. Mm. But you know, I didn't. <laughs> All that education was, was good. But what I really needed there was a missing element. And that, and that really was this, what we now call the release of the Holy Spirit, that I needed more of the Spirit in my life. Um, obviously, I'd been baptized and confirmed. I'd sort of had the, uh, the ordination and all of those were sort of sacraments of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit was within me, of course, and it wasn't as if I was a bad man, um, but I just felt lacking in power, lacking in freedom, lacking in love that comes from the Lord himself, you know, to be able to communicate the love of God to others. Mm. So anyway, uh, coming back to Canberra, after all that study, um, the bishop just um, didn't know what to do with me. Um, and uh, so I got in with young, young people. And uh, these young people, some of them had been ex- had experienced the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. A- and so that's like that new outpouring of the Spirit that's been in, especially moving the Catholic Church since 1967. Uh, and um, But has been very much renewing the life of the church, I think. Uh, and and so I I fell in with these young people and they said, you should go to a priest charismatic retreat. I thought, well, that'd be safe. Priests are safe, you know. <laughs> so there was 100 priests at this retreat. Mm. And the Father Tom Forrest, who was a redemptorist priest from the United States, but at that stage he was working in Rome. Uh, and um, he was preaching it. A- and uh, he had this pitch. It was really simple pitch, Matt. He just sort of had, he said, you've got to be able to say three words. And I'm thinking, what are these three words? I was really hungry. I knew I needed something more, you know. I can not. And I knew it. When he said it, I knew it. That was the truth. Mm. That I had to admit, with all my education and everything, that I couldn't do it. I couldn't be the priest I was meant to be. Uh, I sort of could acknowledge that I'd been 12 years a priest and I, I acknowledged that I brought, things weren't working right, you know, uh, and, and in my own personal life, I couldn't do it. There was disorder in my own personal life that I wasn't overcoming, you know, mm. stuff that was sort of coming back on me again and again. And I, I knew I needed, I needed more. Uh, and so he said, you've got to be able to say, I can't do it. Mm. And so I was at that stage where, yeah, I could say, I can't do it. You know, I remember one time when we're, um, I was in my appointment at a country town in New South Wales and um, I had to sort of, um, you know, get the music going and get the, the liturgy going. After all, you know, it was a time after the Second Vatican Council where sort of a revive and everything like that. So we got a big organ and everything. I got the organist going. I'm standing there saying, now let's sing. They wouldn't sing. Mm. You know? Bloody Australians. They wouldn't sing. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> Well, they were just stolen. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in, in the seminary, we were told they were God's chosen people, but these were God's frozen people. <laughs> <laughs> so that sort of thing. It was, I was finding that something needed to happen mm. that... Uh, you know, and, and I'd sort of work with young people, but then it was just like a social gathering and they'd all pair off and everything. And, well, what happened there? You know, <laughs> so I didn't have the answers that I needed, even though I'd sort of got, was highly educated. Uh, and um, so I was able to say, I can't do it. He said, you've got to be able to say one extra word. Hmm. Yes. Yes, Lord, you can do it. Right. Uh, and 
And I was able to say, this, and, and join your years with that of the Blessed Virgin Mary. You know, when she was faced with the impossible, when the angel came to her and said, you know, um, you're to be the mother of the Messiah, and she's saying, I, I don't have any relations with men. How mm. can that happen? She's faced with the impossible. And she says, how will it happen? And, and she's told by the angel, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and he'll overwhelm you. That's how it's going to happen. He'll overshadow you with his power. And, of course, that's uh, what did happen with the conception of Jesus in her womb. Uh, and so that was it. I just thought, okay, I'll say yes to the Lord. I'll surrender to this, like, big grace, because I knew about this big grace, you see. I knew about this experience of the baptism in the Spirit, I'd already um, been in touch with that from even when I was going through the seminary. I'd heard about it, you know, and I'd been in touch with it when I was at Sydney University too. Uh, and and yet I, I was like a fellow traveler with it. I thought, yeah, that's good stuff for other people. I don't know whether it's for me though. But now I was wanting to say, yes, okay, I want this big grace. It's available. Uh, and and I expect when they prayed over me, I thought maybe I'll explode or something. <laughs> but I didn't explode. That's good. But I just had a, a deep, deep peace mm. in my spirit, you know, a deep peace. And I knew things would be different from now wow. on. And they were, Matt. Everything changed. Really? Everything changed. My How own liberating. personal life. I'm thinking, personal... I'm thinking it's kind of like the opposite of the, um, the, uh, the those kind of – as in, what are those fellows, motivational speakers, you know, yeah. like, you can do it. That's right. It's like, that's the opposite. It, it I is. can't do it. And that, that must be so liberating. It is. Because you've been so, striving to be this good it, preacher. This. Exactly. And it leads you into a surrender to God and giving it over to the Lord and letting him work through you. Yeah. And, and, and that's what began to happen. So, yeah, so I cut you off. What no, started... you're right. No, so I'm, <clears throat> I'm glad you said something because I'm talking too long. That's wonderful. So what <laughs> happened in your life then? That... Well, personal life. You know, I had that sort of thing, which there was a thing that would go on inside of my head, which was like a, a, a sort of a, a lustful type of image that would come yeah. into my head that I could not get out of my head. It mm. was persistent. Mm. Have you ever had anything like that? No, oh, of course. You don't have to confess, but no, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was really strong, but it was consistent, yeah. the persistent. And um, and I, I, I was really frustrated with it, like blazers and... Um, but now, now with the new working of the Spirit, I was able to look to the cross of Jesus and I knew what Jesus had done. And I was able to apply the power of the cross of Jesus and, and actually like image the cross into my mind and it would break that, that image, you know. Mm-hmm. And I just held that cross there and, and, and after a while it was just gone. It's never returned, you know. Praise the Lord. Yeah, you know, it's just a, so it's relying <coughs> on the power of the Lord, not on my own sort of thinking capacity or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but ministry too, ministry changed. You, did you did you know Father Bob Bedard? I did. Yeah, I, I love that fella. Yeah, founder yeah. of the Companions of the Cross yeah. up in Canada. I only met him once though. Yeah. So when he had this experience or something similar to what yes. you had, yes. Um, I don't think he, I think at the time, if my memory serves, he didn't experience anything sensible. Right. But he said he woke up the next day and he had this insatiable appetite for Holy Scripture. Exactly. And he, right. and he, didn't, he, he didn't make the connection between yeah. what had just happened and this, this appetite. Okay. But he picked up the Bible and he sat down and he, several hours he went yes. by and he couldn't stop reading. No, it's good you mentioned that because that's what happened to me too. Like the Scriptures came alive in a whole new way. I mean, I'd studied the scriptures, surely, but now it was different, you know, uh, and and I wanted to get scripture studies and and and, but like, but it was not just sort of the uh, academic study. Mm. It was like the the words were lifting off the page, and and I got really hungry for the Word of God, more and more. And the Spirit does that. See, when the Spirit starts working in our lives, He He just renews things in a new way. And he brings the light of the truth into your heart too. Like truths which I knew, I was now more deeply convicted by, you know, it's the Spirit's going to bring that conviction, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ministry, ministry exploded, you know. Like the youth ministry that I'd been involved in, um, as I said, there were some of them who'd been baptized in the Spirit, but most of them hadn't. Uh, But then all of a sudden, 
I was out of town when it happened. The spirit just fell on the, the whole ministry. Right when you were out of town? I love it. So I said, Speaking love of you can't exactly. do it, you go out and I'll do something. Yeah. Exactly. The spirit just fell on the, on those young people. And it was really bad, well, difficult, because I had to try and explain to the parents what was happening. Yeah. I didn't quite know myself. Yeah. But um, when I came back from World Youth Day in the year 2000, yeah. just I said this to you as a joke, but kind of <laughs> insufferably happy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, my mum met with Bishop Eugene Hurley yeah. somewhat frequently because she thought I'd been brainwashed <laughs> because she had no idea how to comprehend yeah, 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 yeah. why I was so happy and just exactly. to pray all the time. And yeah. I wanted to hug my parents and tell them I love them. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> it scared them. That's right. Yeah, that's what the parents of these kids were like too. They were coming to me saying, what have you done? What have you done? I said, I've done nothing. I was out of town. I was away. <laughs> The spirit moved, yeah. I want to get more into that, but before we do, how yes. would you explain this to a Catholic who's quite skeptical or <laughs> yes. um, of this language? And I think not yeah, without yeah, yeah. not without reason, you know. Oh, yeah, sure. You know, there's different movements in the church, and they can be good, but they can also attract to themselves a sort of baggage. And so yeah. when you use this language, they immediately yes. say associate it with something Protestant or kind of crazy emotionalism. Yeah. How do you explain this to someone in a way that they can hear what you're saying when you talk about this baptism in the Holy Spirit? No, that's good. Uh, by baptism, of course, it's just an immersion. It's a soaking in the Spirit, right? But what uh, we understand it to be, it's, it's, it's closely connected to our sacramental baptism and sacramental confirmation, you see. And that's basically a releasing of the power of those sacraments. And for me, also, the sacrament of orders. The sacraments like come alive in mm. a new way. You see, we know from sacramental theology that the sacraments are effective. Their, their effic efficacy is given by God. You know, if they're performed correctly, then they're efficacious. But their fruitfulness will depend upon the degree to which we are open and surrendered to the grace of the sacrament. And so what was happening to me there mm. is that I was opening and surrendering to the grace of the sacrament of, well, not only uh, baptism and confirmation, but orders as well, because it sort of renewed my priesthood, you know, and, and renewed me as a, a baptized Catholic. So um, it's like that. It's, it's a releasing of the power of the sacrament. Uh, and it's a renewal, a sacramental renewal. Mm. See, as, as adults, we need to be able to do that. And all of the movements in the church are like that, aren't they? They're basically calling us to making uh, a deeper commitment and surrender to the Lord mm -hmm. um, so that our, all that was given to us in its baptism and confirmation is released in power more fully. And that's a constant thing that has to happen, Matt. It's not just sort of a once-up thing, but there are watershed moments, I think. That's how I'd like to explain. Is that, mm. is that the, the sort of thing you're looking for? Yeah. A, yeah. And there's nothing to be afraid of at all, or, or it's not weird. Right. It's fundamental, I think. Uh, like, I, uh, I think this grace, as it were, is meant for everybody because right. it's, uh, it's the Holy Spirit as the soul of the church. And the, without the Holy Spirit, we're finished, you know. Yeah. Uh, but thankfully, we're not going to be finished because the Holy Spirit is guaranteed to be with the church until the end of time. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I think it was Chesterton who said, let your faith be, well, this isn't his exact words, but I, I usually say like less, <laughs> okay. less of a syllogism, more of a love affair. And that exactly. is my fear sometimes that in a world gone mad, yes. we come up with these arguments for God's existence, the divinity of Christ, True. all of which are helpful exactly. and good. Mm. And we kind of want then to argue that upon those around us and hope that they just mentally submit to yeah. this logic and if everyone would just do that and they would get our morality in order yes but and that's there's a that's a part of it but jesus christ is alive and the holy spirit is Amen. moving and he's at work in our lives and he knows you personally yes. that's that's scary in a way yeah. that's scarier it's much closer it's much more intimate <clears throat> but that's what happens of course and that's for me that was the big thing the deeper intimacy with jesus you know knowing him as my lord so you could read Philippians, for example, where, you know, I believe that nothing can outweigh the supreme advantage of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You know, for him, I'm accept the loss of everything and I count everything else is so much rubbish. If only I can have Christ and a place in him. All I want is to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. 
and to reproduce the pattern of his death in my life. That's it. You know, all I want is Jesus. Right? Uh, and the Holy Spirit does that. He, he glorifies mm-hmm. Jesus within us. And more than that too, he opens us to the living Father. Uh, and this is fundamental to who we are as Catholics, really. Mm-hmm. It's fundamental, mm-hmm. but oftentimes it's missed. Unfortunately, people can diffuse, can miss this reality. And, and so opening up to the Father too, you know, where, where Paul says, you know, everyone moved by the Spirit is a son or a daughter of, 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 of the Father. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, son or a daughter of God. And, uh, and the, the Spirit that's given to us, it's not a Spirit that leads us into slavery, mm-hmm. The spirit of, of freedom enabling us to call God Abba, Father. Mm. You know, Abba, uh, and experiencing the Father. So that was a whole journey for me too, opening up to the Father. The Spirit does that, you know. So then yeah. at what point did you start a religious order? How did that happen? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I forgot about and that. And by part. the way, we have a link to your <laughs> The Missionaries of God's Love in the description for those who are watching who want to learn more about this religious order you founded. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, well, that happened um, after, of course, the baptism of the Spirit. Um, what the next step, actually, was um, where I was here in the United States again, and um, so many things happened in the United States. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was visiting a covenant community, which is like a community of charismatic Catholics who have sort of commit themselves to live this life together and be like a microcosm of the church within the life of the church of course but uh, living the the Catholic life more intensely uh, which I think is a great thing to do Uh, and lay people and so I was in one of these these communities and um, I heard Father Francis Martin do you remember him? Maybe yeah. Yeah, it goes back a bit. The he, name's familiar. He was a scripture scholar yeah. from the Mother of God community in Washington. Okay. But he was uh, you know, a scholar from the Akol Biblique in, in Jerusalem. But he got this experience of the Holy Spirit. And so he went up to uh, Catherine de Hook, the Oetis community mm-hmm. in uh, Camomile. I've been in, there. In, you've yeah. been there? Yeah. So he, he spent a year in the Pustinia. <laughs> that's, so sh- that's how I'm knowing his name, yeah. He was sharing about this. Wow. And during that year, he said he felt he was called by God to place his life under the grace of this renewal. So and when he shared that, I thought, oh, that's what I'm meant to do, place my life under this grace, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I went back to Australia and joined uh, a community that was starting a lay community in Canberra. Disciples of Jesus, was that it? Yeah, yeah. we now call it Disciples of Jesus. It, in oh. those days it was called Hepsi Bar, would you believe? <laughs> That's such <laughs> a 70s crazy. charismatic name to come up with. <laughs> what does yeah, that mean? It means God's delight. <laughs> Beautiful. You know in Isaiah 62 where it says, you know, I'll call yeah. you the wedded, my delight, Beautiful. right? Mm. But um, we changed the name to Disciples of Jesus. That sounds <laughs> Hepsibar. <laughs> Hepsibar sounds like... We, we realised too that there was actually a witch called Hepsibar, which oh. wasn't probably the best thing. <laughs> but um, where was I? Uh, yeah. So you came and joined this community in Melbourne? Yeah, I think. Canberra. So Canberra. Canberra, yeah. yep. I did. So I, I presented myself to them. I said, but you're a priest, you can't join us. We're... So I just let me hang around, you know. <laughs> so, so I hung around. <laughs> Uh, and I ended up becoming, of course, one of the leaders of the community, uh, together with these lay men who are, you know, strong men of God, you know. Uh, a, a beautiful experience, really. Uh, and, I, and I came into the community partly because of my own need for fellowship, for brotherhood, you yeah. know, uh, and, and for sisters as well. But it was, like, it was more the brotherhood thing that drew me in, right? Uh, but it was also under that sense of calling that I was to place my life under the grace of the renewal. And but then after three years of this, and we had a lot of young people come and join us because I was leading up this large youth group, as I said, you know, for 100 young people jumping out of the skin and the spirits. And, <laughs> and, um, and I felt they, they needed a place where they could just really be committed, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and, and live a committed life rather than just, you know, how youth groups, they sort of have a time and then they just disappear. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and most of the young people get lost or something. I, they needed a context where they could be challenged and called forward and deeply committed in their, their journey for, you know, lasting fruit, you know, not just have good fruit, but lasting fruit. So anyway, um, uh, where was I? I was with the 
Disciples yeah. of Jesus in yeah, Canberra. Exactly. And I want to know how you went from that to founding a religious order. That's it. Okay, you got me. So basically what happened is that three of these young guys, um, you know, they, they independently came to me in, and um, each one said, I want to become a priest, but I want to stand at this grace. Mm. How can we do it? I said, I don't know. So I said, let's meet. And so we met uh, in a pizza shop and um, we uh, talked about it. And then um, I said, what we should do is we'll have a year of praying about this. So we spent a whole year praying. Mm. Um, well, you know, we meet on Wednesdays and we pray for Wednesday afternoon. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, other times we'd be sort of holding it up to God and just listening. Uh, what did God want? You know? Uh, and we just heard, it was before the Blessed Sacrament. That's how we started, of course, always good things start before the Blessed Sacrament. <laughs> and um, we just asked the Lord to speak to us. And he spoke prophetically. It was just beautiful. Like, um, you know, he'd tell us that he wanted us to be brothers together and serve one another. So we'd go and, <laughs> we'd go and get towel and water and we'd wash one another's feet. Beautiful. <laughs> you know, Beautiful. Was that sort of thing. Yeah. And, you know, he wanted us to... Um, consecrate ourselves to his wounded heart broken open in love for the world yeah and so um we took down the cross and we k- kissed the cross mm. you know he's broken Praise uh, the Lord. Uh, and um that sort of thing so we, we and you know we were to sort of um, entrust ourselves to the blessed virgin mary you know mm-hmm. that sort of thing so we got this whole thing and we realized by the end of that year that God was doing something, that he wanted us to form something we didn't know what i thought it was probably an alternative form of us and priesthood because I was a dust and priest, I, I didn't even know what religious did. I had no idea about religious very much at all. You know, I knew they existed, of course. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, so anyway, that's. But what what the Lord was doing, He was speaking very much about living a life of radical poverty, uh, and uh, that came very strongly. Uh, and I, I kept on wherever I turned. I was hearing this rich young man story. I was still a young priest in those days, <laughs> but a relatively rich young priest. Uh, and um, <laughs> so, uh, and I'd hear those words of Jesus, you know, when the rich young man came up and said, what must I do? Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. He said, I've always kept the commandments. And he said, there's one thing more. As he looked steadily at him and loved him, you see, mm. That's important. He looked steadily at him and loved him. I felt the Lord was looking steadily at me and loving me, Mm -hmm. saying there's one thing more that you have to do. There's one thing that you lack. Go sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And I really felt that was the Lord speaking to me, you know. Now, I know that that text doesn't speak that way to everyone in the same way, but for me, I felt I had to do it literally. Mm Mm-hmm. And also, at the same time, I was reading The Life of Francis of Assisi. Oh, dangerous combination. <laughs> dangerous. <laughs> uh, and so that's what happened. Um, uh, what did that after, look like, selling everything? I mean, how much did you actually have as a diocesan priest? I, not, I didn't have a lot. I, I think it must have been about 15000 or something like that. That's, but a, it was, not, that's not insignificant. No, no, in those days. It's a very well back. And, and a car, of course, and that sort of thing. So I just had to give it all away. Wow. But, um, so I went to the guy who was um, my advisor at the time. I said, what do you think, you know? Am, am I mad? And um, he said, well, you're very open to God. You better do it quickly before you change your mind. <laughs> kind of like how you became a priest. i got to do it now or something <laughs> yes, won't happen. Yes. <laughs> it was like that. But, um, but the funny thing about it is that I did give it all away. I wrote out the check and everything. But I forgot that I had some debts. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so that was funny. So you gave it all but away no. and then you realized you owed money. <laughs> and then the Lord had to provide, I guess. Well, the France of Assisi thing was very important too because, um, you know, the, the question there was like, is it possible today to live the gospel radically as a priest? That was my question. Yeah. Um, and I, I felt, well, I'm called to do that. I really f- I've felt all the way that what's most important in the church today is that there are people who are living the gospel radically uh, before preaching, you know, that actually you seek to sort of live it, right? 
So I didn't realize I was moving towards consecrated life as such, uh, as like a, the form of consecrated life. I just knew that God was calling me to live the gospel radically. And another question in my mind too was from um, Paul the Sixth mm-hmm. when he wrote the Evangelii Nunziandi mm-hmm. back in 1975. He asked the question, how is it possible today to co- proclaim the gospel in such a way that it will convert our contemporaries? How is it going to be possible to do that? And from that question, I became more and more convinced that people need to live the gospel. And, and so in the lay community I was in, we were seeking to live a, a strong gospel way of life, you know, and that would attract and draw people and be a context. And, and then I felt for myself as a priest that I was called to go that step further, you know, in sort of living uh, a radical poverty and trusting the Lord in it for everything, right, in that sort of way. And the, the young guys came with me on that, you know. <clears throat> And so we just trusted the Lord and went into a little house in the suburbs and <laughs> waited upon the Lord's provision, and he's never let us down. So what does that look like on a day-to-day basis, living this sort of poverty? Because often it, I would imagine it begins with an exactly. you know, eruption of enthusiasm, That's but then right. you say, well, come on here, we've got to be, You've got to be got practical. We've got cars to here so that we can drive exactly. to people's houses. To... Exactly. That's right. So how, how did that – and yet, and yet at the same time – I imagine that spirit wants to push back against that practical attitude where you yeah. try to provide for the future instead of just relying on the Lord today. Yeah. How did you find that balance? Well, that's a really good question. And that's all, always been part of the, the journey, I think. Um, and I can tell you the truth right at this moment. The missionaries of God's love don't have enough finance to get to the end of the year. Um, <laughs> is that good or not? Are you about to ask for money or is that I what you want? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, but it's, we, we really Crikey. are. We do live on the edge, right? You're not wrong. Because you've been, you've been a religious order now for how long? Since you've begun to now, yeah, how many yeah, years yeah. is that? But then that's, well, I'm t- so the comment I just made there is just about our central fund. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, uh, we have uh, like eight, six missions and all those missions are self-sustaining, okay. right? So it's not as if the whole thing's... <laughs> okay. <laughs> but there is a sort of a way in which we, we do live on the edge uh, yeah. in that regard. But, but, but at the same time, obviously, we make a distinction too between the way we live and the mission that we engage in. So the mission that we engage in, we'll really seek to have as much fun as we need to really give glory to God and to bring as many people to the Lord, right? Mm-hmm. So we need, say, for equipment like you've got here, we want to have the same equipment. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but in your personal houses, Yeah, we try and it, keep it simple, yeah. Like yeah. what? Is there any specific guidelines that you set up for these different houses? I know for the Friars of the Renewal, for example, they'll sleep on the floor, they only wear the habit. Yeah, right. That sort of thing. Uh, Are there not, any... No, we, we do have beds, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but we, we try to keep the food very simple mm-hmm. and, and our way of life simple. So we're not sort of like always out sort of doing um, um, swank things, etc. And we do rely upon, um, you know, food coming in at times. Like say for the house I live in, we're, we're actually always going to the markets and getting the stuff at the end of the day, mm-hmm. that sort of thing, you know, keeping it really simple. Mm. So simple, simple life is really important. So I, I like to call it like a joyful simplicity. Okay, you know, and and it depends on the on the context too, because you know we're in uh, countries that are very poor, like for example Indonesia and and the Philippines, and their context is different from from mm. in, in Australia as well, because so, Australia is sort of like obviously very affluent, and um, but uh, yeah, it's trying to keep it simple. Uh, like we don't own anything, um, nobody I don't possess anything. Mm-hmm. You know, keeping clothing simple, um, entertainment simple. Um, you know, the, what, uh, what's in the house is simple. Just trying to keep it really sort of like uh, we make a distinction between um, what we call um, uh, felt needs and real needs. Um, so we only live with real needs rather than felt needs. And if you, as a religious order, are mm. engaging with people in the Philippines and Indonesia, I'm yes. sure that is a constant reminder to you of... It is actually, Matt. Yeah, it's been very helpful for us, actually. 
because our primary a primary motive for living poverty is actually um, the love of the Lord, you know, uh, like the man who found uh, the treasure in the field mm. and he sold up everything mm-hmm. so he could just have that field, right? That's so it's a, it's a joyful decision to let go of everything. It's like those first Franciscans when they just sort of took the money from uh, and just threw it out onto mm-hmm. into the marketplace and. The really joyful people were not the people who were picking up the money, but but the ones that were actually giving away. Now, because you were reading about Francis of Assisi and you had yes. this desire to live a life of poverty, did you ever consider joining a Franciscan group that was part of the renewal, like the no, CFRs? Never, or, never did, no. no, no. But very much inspired by Francis, though, at the same time. Mm-hmm. But um, we have other, other um, ones, like, for example, Ignatius too. we would look to him as well, uh, for a lot of our uh, way of doing things. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Francis, but in the initial stage, Francis was very prominent, really, and inspiring us. But I never felt called to be a Franciscan. Who was was the priest? There was a priest um, of your order who was the vocations director at the time. (laughs) This was back in 2001 or two. Yeah. Uh, What's his name? Chris Ryan. No. Chris, Father Chris. Chris Ryan. That was him. And I think I called him and we were talking. And, yeah. you know, I was very idealistic about poverty and things like yeah, this. Yeah, this yeah. sounds great. Yeah, and he yeah. said, well, it's not that great when you're driving to a parishioner's house and you run out of gas and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's very funny. <laughs> yeah. So how many priests and brothers are in your religious order right now? We only have um, about 35 priests, I think it is. Um and we don't have many brothers at all because they've all wanted to become priests eventually. They started mm. off thinking they want to be brother, but then they <laughs> become priests. We've got um, six guys being ordained this year, Pretty which is really good. Yeah. And, um, and um, uh, yeah, and good number in formation. There's 20 in our seminary in Melbourne. And then in the formation house in Canberra, there's another um, eight, I think it is. And then... Um, and then there's others in, in aspirancies in um, other houses as well. So we've got quite a lot of people looking at us and coming to sort of, because all that gets worked out over time. Yeah. Yeah. How do you rely on the Lord as you seek to grow an order? And how much do you have to battle pride as that order grows? I, I could imagine someone wanting success. Exactly. I want more men, I want more brothers. Exactly. I want the bishops and those around Australia to look at us and say they're doing it right and look at them, they're exploding. I'm sure that's something you have to wrestle with, just like a bishop does with his own diocese, and yet you're trying just to be faithful to the Lord and take what comes. How do you, you see what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, no, I see what you're saying, yeah. Um, actually, I've just been doing a retreat here at the, at the Franciscans, and um, the Lord's been speaking to me about humility you know, um, because the deepest root is pride, really, in all of our hearts, really, one way or another. Mm. You think you've got it chopped out and then it pops up again. It's like one of those weeds in the garden that you think you've got out and it, you find it over somewhere else. You cut it out there and you find it over somewhere else. So, yeah, I feel that it's a, a call. Um, it's like, um, if it's Francis is good here because he said you could, you can only be before God what you are, no more, no less, you know. Mm. Um, what you are before God. And um, uh, how do I stand before God, you know? Well, there's a weak, broken, wounded man who the Lord has chosen to use for his own purposes. Um, and it's like um, John the Baptist, you know, when John the Baptist says... Um, he must grow greater. Yeah. I must grow less. Yeah. And he also said, also said, Oh, just sorry, that's not what you were no, you, saying. No, you're right. No, that, I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm coming to that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> no, it's, that's, that's really the outcome of it. But it's like one stage they, they were saying to John the Baptist just before that, what you just quoted, they were sort of saying, you know, um, there's the Messiah, uh, Jesus, and he's, he's baptizing now. And um, yeah. so what, how do you feel about that? Yeah. And, and John said, um, uh, a man can only claim what is given him from God, no more, no less. And that's it. You have to know what's given you from God mm. 
and rejoice in that, but not to seek to claim any more, right? Does that mm, make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It does yeah, make sense. So he must increase and I must decrease, yeah. Being the, the friend of the bridegroom, you know, John mm. uses that image, doesn't he? That um, the friend of the bridegroom was had the job of waiting for the bridegroom to come and then to connect the bridegroom to the bride. It's like that. The, uh, and, and then the friend of the bridegroom just disappears. And so I see myself like the friend of the bridegroom, Jesus, seeking to connect him to as many people as possible, and I must disappear, you know. There's something beautiful about that, you know, because there's many people I've connected to the Lord. And no, 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 and they'll pop up later on and they'll say, wow, do you remember that time when you, uh, I don't remember anything, you know. Mm. But it's just beautiful, isn't it, that the Lord uses you in that way. Yeah. So I can't claim anything because it's the Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's the Lord, you know. I and, once, and, but but I, in my heart, as you say, my heart is not pure in that regard. I can sometimes, so thoughts can arise that are prideful thoughts and so you have to you know, of course. put them against the cross of Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. How do you, um, and this is a question I want you to answer for the sake of everyone listening who's struggling with the same thing. Yeah. How do we... Um, trust that the Lord is at work in our life when we keep running up against our own wretchedness, you know? <clears throat> so we have this, we kind of vacillate between, oh, I'm pretty bloody good to like, I am a heap of dung, um, <laughs> you know? Like I, I, I encounter that. I was at an airport the other day, yeah. Boston. And if this fella's yes. watching, I think his name's Stephen. He came up to me and went, do you run a podcast? I said, no. Yeah, I do. And, 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 and I, I gave him a miraculous medal that I got from France and we had a lovely chat and he's talking about how he's beginning to come back to his faith and how yeah, clients lovely. is working, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I'm at one moment grateful to God. Yes. Also so aware of my own That's, impotency yeah, and the yeah. stupid things I say or things I could say better. You see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, it's beautiful. And I, I once heard a priest, yeah. I've repeated this a million times on the show, say, Lord, use even my bullshit as manure for their growth. <laughs> I, I think there's something terribly profound in that. Yeah, there is. Yeah. You just give everything to the exactly. Lord. Exactly. Yeah. Now, I'm glad you raised all this because it's so important. I'm, I've been telling you the story. You know, it sounds like a story of glory or something, but it's not really... It's a story of a broken, sinful man, you know, who the Lord has taken hold of. And um, and you see, there's nothing to be ashamed about in that, I don't think. And that the Lord doesn't want to shame us or feel disgraced or, or lowly. Like, um, you know, he, the only people he's got to work with is broken people. Mm. And, and a lot of the journey is actually realizing our brokenness and our weakness uh, and that we've got nothing to bring, you know. Uh, and the slum condition of our own s state of the soul, you know, mm -hmm. um, uh, that's a good place to be because then, you mm -hmm. know, it's all the saving power of Jesus. That's all his work. It's all his, his grace upon us, yeah. isn't it, really? So I, I trust that I'll always be like the guy at the back of the temple, not the guy up the front who's sort of mm. you know, pounding his chest and saying, I'm doing well, and presenting himself to God as if he's got it all together, mm. you know, uh, and which is just a fallacy. He, he, you know, he's kidding himself. Um, but the what guy at the back of the temple in Jesus' parable is crying out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm. Now he's the, he's the one who goes home at right with God, you know. So I just hope I'm in that that place, and you know, and even coming to prayer, you can sort of you know you can feel that what you're just expressing there that um, there's something of of the pride that can rise in your heart, but um, but really coming in reality before the Lord, you know, not some sort of pretense, mm -hmm. you know, um, and so like. Um, that's that's a key, isn't it? That I, I'm not going to try and pretend that I'm more than what I am, but I'm just as I am, as as the Lord has called me and chosen me, you know, and and whatever has come forward is by His grace, you know. Um, it, you know, <laughs> what comes to mind is um, it was Trace Lizier. Yeah, yeah Trace Lizier. She she said. One proud thought, hmm. one proud thought about 
virtue gained uh, it means you're on the, the bridge of the abyss. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I live. Is it pretty heavy? <laughs> <laughs> So it's, you know, because... Uh, um, I was just at Lazure a week ago. Oh, were you really? Yeah. Oh, praise the Lord. And, you know, it was beautiful. My wife and I got to yes. go and see her childhood home. Oh, and lovely. then you look up the road to this gigantic basilica that they built. <laughs> and it's beautiful. And you've got that crypt where Zelly yes. and... Is it Louise or Louis? Louise, Louis, yeah. Um, yeah. Are buried and you think yeah. they could have never guessed. You what know. an amazing family. Yeah, and what a quiet life. What a quiet little life. Um, the book, I Believe in Love, has blessed me tremendously. It's a retreat based on the teachings of Therese of Lisieux. And there's a line in there I keep repeating because it's just terrific. Yes. Because I think often when priests and others talk about the love of God and he loves you, yes, yeah. we can sometimes think they're saying, you're not that bad, you know. And sometimes <laughs> they do say that. <laughs> well, what he says in this book is, I'm not telling you, you believe too much in your own wretchedness. We are far more wretched than we could possibly imagine. <laughs> what I'm telling you is you do not believe enough in the merciful love of Jesus. Exactly. Like that's, that's, the, that's the abyss that captures our miserable yeah. heart. And that's been my own journey has been, I think, that of mercy. You know, that what has spoken to me a lot is Peter's journey, you mm -hmm. know. You know, I'll go to prison with you, I'll die with you, Lord. And then and the Lord looks at Peter and says, Oh Peter <laughs> Well the cock crows, you'll have disowned me three times. And Peter's thinking, You're kidding, no way. You know, he's got that bravado, he's got mm -hmm. to push through. Such a lovable guy. But what he should have said is what that priest said to you on that retreat, I cannot. Exactly. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so there he is. And, of course, he... But then he has that moment when Jesus looks at him and looks, gospel, Jesus, uh, his eyes, mm -hmm. catch the eyes of Peter, and Peter sees the eyes of Jesus. He's just, you know denied the Lord three times. <laughs> and mm. it, it just, just imagine that gaze of Jesus. I think it was a gaze of, of mercy. You know, it certainly would have mm. been the gaze of a wounded heart mm. because it was his best friend, you know. But, uh, and Jesus is very human, but, uh, but it was a gaze of mercy. And that's what enabled Peter not to sort of do what Judas did. You mm. know? Judas went out and hung himself. Because um, he gave into the despair, Peter could have done that too. Because his sin was no no uh, less than than uh, than Judas's, but but Peter he he had seen those eyes of mercy, and that's the truth of my life too. I've I've seen the eyes of mercy of the Lord, and I can tell you that it's it's His mercy. It's His mercy that. Um, has, has saved me, and um, and only by His mercy, anything's happened that's been uh, enriching in my life, you know. And so much has been enriching. It's all His gift, you know. It's all grace, isn't it? Really, mm. yeah. And we live by that, really, and by the grace of God. Yeah, and so you know, it says, doesn't it? By grace we've been saved, not by anything of our own efforts, mm. you know. So that we could boast, yeah. Yeah. You know, we're kind of thrown into this world, as it were, and we all try to get along, be in community with people, hope that we're lovable, yeah. sense that we may not be, cover up for our deficiencies. Mm -hmm. we, we live among old people who do this, and without the Lord, what do we have? Well... We need to be attractive so they'll like us, so they won't leave us. Yeah. Because our deepest fear is to be left alone. Sure. And then there's all these ideologies on offer in the world that we can attach ourselves to mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we feel like ontologically, at least as, as, it, as it pertains to our purpose and m meaning, it's just vacant. Yeah. You know? So we have to now fill ourselves up so that we can be someone that's then acceptable. How is Christianity... And the love of Jesus and walking with Jesus, the antidote to that, you know? Preach to us, Father. 
what I'm saying. <laughs> well, of course, um, it's Jesus. You know, that intimacy with the Lord is, is really what matters. And um, so what would you say when you were just expressing there, what would you say was the deepest cry in the heart of someone who's actually of that mindset? I think it's, I want to be seen for what I actually am. Exactly. And I want that to be enough somehow. That's exactly it. So I see, it's the grace, it's the love of God. You see, the deepest cry in the human heart is what the cry you're making there is a cry for love. To know that I'm, I'm loved infinitely, I'm loved uh, unconditionally, I'm worthwhile, I'm acceptable in myself. I don't have to prove myself before anybody. I don't have to make myself look good before others. Mm. You know, my value and my worth is not dependent upon what others think of me or, or how I'm assessed or, or evaluated by others at all. Uh, or, or it's not dependent on my achievements. You know, the great, great grace I received at one moment in a, on a retreat when I was struggling with all this stuff is the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, I've always found you acceptable. You are acceptable in my eyes. I've always found you acceptable. Now, what he, he wasn't saying I found your behavior acceptable sometimes, <laughs> but you're acceptable. You see, that's when Jesus met the, the woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, you know, she's thrown before him and they're accusing her and all that sort of thing. Now Jesus speaks to her, you know, uh, and first of all he sort of says, well look, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone and, and the guys disappear. And then he's with her and he says, is there anyone here to condemn you? And she said, no one, sir. And then he said, neither do I condemn you. Go sin no more. So he, he administered acceptance to her. And because she knew she was accepted, that gave her the power to go sin no more. Right? Otherwise, if, if it was a word of condemnation, then it just throws her back into that cycle of sin. If it was a word of acceptance. Of, she's accepted as a person. I don't condemn you. So there's no, how, con how, how there's con no condemnation in the heart of Jesus. Huh? How does condemnation throw her back into the cycle of sin? What does that mean? Well, if she feels condemned, then her worth and her value is, not, is, is naught. And so she's going to just go back into that stuff again. Yeah. But did you get it? Yeah, if I'm worthless, yeah, I may as well act exactly. worthless. Yeah. It's who you are, you see. So the Lord wants to affirm every human person who they really are in him, mm. created in goodness, you see. Uh, uh, he, he's made us that way for him, you know, and we won't find who we really are until we find him and, and come more deeply into the love that he has for us. It's his love. And that's why I'm a missionary of God's love, because I, I noticed with the young people that we were working with that that was their deepest hunger. And it came down to it, that's what they wanted to know. They wanted to know that they were truly loved by God, even though they couldn't articulate that, of course. And when they came to experience that love, uh, everything starts to work. You know, they can actually they have the freedom to repent. Mm. You see, we say, we, we don't get repentance just by saying condemning people for their behavior. Mm -hmm. And saying, that's wrong behavior, you've done it. When young people come to our camps, we don't condemn them at all. We know they're all in disordered relationships. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's wrong in their lives. But we just preach the love of God. And they get won by the love. Mm. Overwhelmed by the love, you know, touched and... And, and then, of course, they have a freedom to change huh? um, because they, they're, they're hungry then for, for what's on offer, mm -hmm. you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Mm. Um, mm. I love the story you tell in your book, Becoming Fire, <laughs> about, is it Aldonza? Is that how I say the name? <laughs> yes. Could you share that story with us? Well, yeah, so I'll do my best. I'm sure you've shared it a thousand times, but... <laughs> do you mind if I just have a drink Have first? a little drink of water. <laughs> yeah, it's a story that just 
is an it's an it's an allegory for the human heart. It's exactly yeah. What it was told saying. by Piet Franson um, when he on his book on grace back in the in the twentieth century, <laughs> but. Um, it's a beautiful story, really. It's, it's a story from uh, Mal the Muncher, mm-hmm. really. Aldonza was a, a woman in, you know, she was about 23 or something like that, in a tavern in, in Spain, and she served up drinks to the guys, but in the daytime, but in the nighttime, she allowed her body to be used and ravaged by them for their, out of their lust. So she hated herself, and she had this sort of like, a, a whole aspect was sort of very much like, just beaten and, and mm. unloved and uncared for and just broken sort of person, really, just used by others. And, and But into the town one day came a young man and he had a spring in his step and a uh, smile on his dial and a light in his eyes and he beheld Odonza. And he saw through the exterior hardness that she'd built up uh, uh, and saw her inner beauty, and he called her by a new name, Dulcinea, which means the beautiful one in mm. Spanish, huh? And she spat at him, she cursed him, <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't accept it, impossible, you know. But then uh, he kept coming back, and she'd just spurn him and just couldn't receive this. But gradually, after, after much persistence and bringing flowers and all that sort of thing, she began to think, maybe it is true. Maybe I am the beautiful one. And people noticed that in Aldonza now there was a, a new spring in her step, a mm. new light in her eyes, and a new smile on the dial, because she was the beautiful one, being called by a new name. Now, it relates to that sort of text in Isaiah, mm. where, you know, in Isaiah 40, 43, I think it is, you know, uh, I've called you by a new name. It's a um, beautiful thing, I said, do not be afraid, Israel. You know, you know I've redeemed you, I've called you by name, mm. you are mine. Right? That sort of sums up in a way. In a para- as a parable, it sums up how God comes, you know. He comes to win us by his love. He comes to overwhelm us by love. Mm. He draws the heart. He persuades the heart. That's my understanding of, ga- of grace. Like grace is like that persuasive action of God, mm. the spirit within, you know, tugging at our heartstrings, you know, and seeking to convince us that, that we're beautiful in his eyes. You know, he's made us for himself, and our hearts are restless until we rest in him. Mm. You know, he's, he's our purpose. He's our reason for living. You know? And, and, and he, he wants, us, he wants us to rejoice over us and renew us by his love, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking of the second chapter in Song of Songs. Something uh-huh. similar happens here. Beautiful. Where he stands behind the wall exactly. at the window Beautiful. through the lattice, and he yeah. says beautiful things yeah exactly and the bird has her head buried in the cleft of the rock as mm. if to say don't say those things to me they can't yeah, possibly yeah. be true that's right and that's the shame thing you see a lot of people are held back because of shame you know and i was like that too oh, yeah yeah but that text that you just talked about that was a shame where i think it's it's a beautiful text actually do you mind if i just I'd get love it you to read it yeah yeah because um and I, I think it's very much what um, the Lord w- wants to say to many of us, maybe. And, th- and he said it to me because uh, there was a shame in my heart for things of, of the past. Yeah. Where I hadn't really sort of lived the life I was meant to live, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and all of us have got something of that. But then there's this, and th- these words, they're a bit sort of like... Um, well, uh, sweet as it were, but um, and, and for sometimes a man may not be able to sort of uh, take them because they might be a bit too sort of uh, seemingly sentimental. But it really struck me, uh, and uh, and I noticed that um, people like John of the Cross and others have experienced that too. Mm. So it's where the bridegroom saying to the bride, you know, 
Come then, my love, my lovely one, come, my dove, mm. hiding in the clefts of the rock, in the coverts of a cliff. Show me your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is sweet and your face is beautiful. So mm. come out of your shame. You don't have to hide anymore. You don't have to fear that you're going to be rejected or, or unloved or somehow other discarded because of your failures. And but keep, come. Yeah. Yeah, go on. Keep reading though because okay, yeah. what, we're, what we're getting mm. to is elucidated here too. Catch the foxes? Yeah. For us. The little foxes that make havoc of the vineyards. For our vineyards are in flower. My beloved is mine and I am his. Whew. See that, I know that we could interpret yes. this in many ways, but one, in, one spiritual interpretation that I've thought of as I've read yes. that is that these foxes that are spoiling the vineyard exactly. are these, these evil thoughts I've that are spoiling the soul. True, man. And yeah, the, those souls could be that you've done too much wrong. Or exactly. that you're too imperfect, mm. or that you had your chance, but you've screwed it up, and this is what you're left with, so just sleep in the bed you've Beautiful. made. Yeah. And he says lovely things to us. And I tell you, I, I, I felt like that little bird, and I, I just want to turn around and give Jesus the finger, which yeah. shocks people when you say that, and they get very offended. But I don't, I don't know how you couldn't know what that means. Yeah. How do you, someone who is, has caught a glimpse of your own depravity, Yes. Stand before someone who looks at you without irony and says, you're beautiful. Exactly. Go to hell. Don't tell me that. It's, it's, <laughs> it's Peter in the boat. Get away from exactly. me, Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he doesn't exactly. go away. No, he, he just doesn't. And he he's persists. not put off. He's not he put persists. off by the no. hardness. Exactly. That's right. You know, there's two texts in the Song of Songs I like to put together. It used to be a song we sang, My beloved is mine and I am his, like that one. And his banner over me is love. Mm-hmm. Right? I like that image because one of it is a nuptial image. My beloved is mine and I am his. That's what we see first of all is that nuptial imagery. But then his banner over me is love. What's that mean? His banner over me is love. Well, I think that it's a military image. You know where the battle used to be between two Mm -hmm. armies and the king's banner Mm -hmm. was there, right? And, and the, the conquering king would put his banner down on the new territory. So his banner over me is love. Mm-hmm. So the Lord's starting to win and persuade my heart and conquer me, as it were, you know, overwhelm me by his love so that I allow him to, you know, to, in a way, defeat me mm-hmm. uh, in, in the sense that conquer me, you know, yes. so that he puts his banner down over me and he says, this, this is my territory. Pass huh? me this beautiful book here. Uh huh. Because there's so much in here. No, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Uh, I belong to the Lord now. Mm. I'm thinking too, um, where, he t- where this one, I love this. Uh, As an apple tree among the trees of the orchard, so is my beloved among young men. Yeah, in his right. long, f- longed for shade, I am seated, and his fruit is sweet to my taste. So from Beautiful. this, what I receive is, uh, well, sometimes uh, the translation I read is an apple tree among the trees of the forest. Right. And so okay. I've got this idea of these powerful, big, awe-inspiring trees. Yes. And then an apple tree in comparison to that is sure. not that impressive, uh-huh. but it's the only thing that can feed you. Okay. So I've got this idea of wandering through the forest, distracted by the glories of the world, yes, but longing for shade, yeah, longing for sustenance. Beautiful. And yeah. so sitting before this thing that at first doesn't seem to be terribly terrific, yeah, but it's the only thing that'll save you. That's fantastic. Can we stay in the Song of Let's Songs? Let's do it. Gonna... <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> One of my favorite ones, the Song of Songs 8.6. But the translation... Um, in um, in the office of um, virgins, the translation is very beautiful, where it says, um, uh, "Love is a flash of fire that no torrents can quench and no floods can drown. Love is a flash of fire from the heart of God that no torrents can quench and love no floods can drown. For love." A man is prepared to give up everything he has and count nothing of the cost mm. for love. So we get won over by the love of God, you know. 
And uh, it's, that's where, I, unfortunately, I think we've, I was missing out on until I had this experience of the Spirit. And so many, I think, may be missing out on um, in their own personal lives because <clears throat> we tend to think, I have to fight myself to get there, you know? I have to climb up this ladder of holiness and uh, and then I find myself falling off mm. and then I try to climb up again, I fall off again. And the Lord's saying, let me lift you. There's let Therese of Lisieux again. Chest. Yeah, that's right, mm. with the elevator. Huh? <laughs> yeah, lift me, take me, or oh, I hit the that's all right. She's got that beautiful line about, um, you know, she says, it's your arms, Jesus, which are the elevator that will lift yes, me. Yes, beautiful. I, so for that to happen, I don't need to become bigger. In fact, I have to become smaller. And so she says exactly. so something to the effect, it's a joy for me to put up with myself the way that I am. Yeah, <laughs> you know? how true. Golly. Yeah, I like it. That's humility yeah. there, isn't it? To put up with it ourselves is, the way that we are. I think so, yeah. I, sometimes, I think a therapist once said to me that when, when sometimes people – going to therapy, trying to find yeah. healing, obviously a good and noble thing. Yeah. But sometimes this can mask a sort of self-hatred where I'm, I need to be better. I need to be fixed. Yeah, true. I don't like these. The self-acceptance is the key, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, in the light of God. There you go. Yeah. That's the, in the yeah, I was going to ask God. you that. What's the difference between the self-acceptance yeah. that the world preaches and the self-acceptance no. that we Christians should accept? In the light of God, yeah. Yeah. And the light of his love. Yeah, that's the that's the thing, and he ministers that to us. I think, really, yeah. Because we know, I always um, encourage people in retreats to um, look to the eyes of the Lord and see His eyes upon you. You know how He beholds you. Behold yourself as as He beholds Him. Mm. You know, not as as you sort of might try to sort of think, but let see His gaze upon you, and then you'll see the truth. You'll see the both sides of yourself, which is really humility, because humility is truth, isn't it? Yeah. You see, on the one hand, your absolute beauty and, and goodness and uh, of, of your, your being that he has given to you, he's created you in that way and how he delights in you. But you'll also see the darker side of yourself too. And But the Lord will disclose that to you, not to sort of, you feel condemned, mm. but so that, the more you see that, you'll uh, more and more be able to surrender to him, you know, because through our weakness, you know, we find his strength. Huh? Yeah. I think it's Teresa of Avila who has that analogy of walking through a tunnel. And when the light is far off, you know, you look right, down and you think, okay. I'm, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. Like I'm a, I'm a good person, you know, mm -hmm. I don't hurt anybody. I'm not Hitler. <laughs> of course, the, the closer we get to the light, we get, what, gee, there's something on my shirt there. Flick that yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. Of course, the closer that's... and closer we get, we see it. Exactly. And that's why Paul can say, I'm the greatest sinner. Yeah, but, that's, that's right. But he so, doesn't recognize that apart from the love of Christ. It's like the John across the stained glass window, same thing. Yeah. yeah, the light coming through the stained glass window. You clean it, and then you get the light. The sun gets brighter, and you see more. <laughs> and then you see more smudges. You know, you it's know, like that. I want to talk a little bit about the charismatic renewal, um, and I want to kind of maybe couch it this way. Okay. You know, you, you talk, you, you think about this revolution that took place among the mendicant orders, the Dominicans and the Franciscans, like yes, this explosion yes, 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 yes. of vocations. Yeah, 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 it's hardly yeah. believable when you mm. hear the numbers of young men that were leaving everything to join Francis. Yes, and yes. so you might hear about that, hear about all the good. And then you look around and go, well, where, where, where are they now? Why aren't, where are the big Franciscan orders? And obviously there are some doing some good, but it's nothing like that seemed to be. And so you think yes. to yourself, would you mm. maybe, maybe it was all for naught, <laughs> forgetting the fact that these tens of thousands of men who influence tens of thousands of others might be before the Lord now because of this explosion of grace, right? Yes. Yeah. And I want to liken that maybe to whatever happened because <laughs> I yes. wasn't there in the 70s and 80s of this yes. very explosive. I think it's probably hard for people my age and younger to even understand what was taking place in the church that time. This mm. explosion of grace that was messy, that yes. sometimes got weird. <laughs> yeah, true. And yet mm. souls were being saved. Yes. I want you to talk about that, but I, I also want you to talk about mm. it realizing that a lot of people have very negative views about the charismatic community, right? Because maybe they grew right. up in a covenant community. And they yes, saw the yes, filth yes, yes, yes. and the, yeah. you, you see, you see mm. what I'm saying? So mm. it might sound good on paper, 
but it got weird, it got cultish, and then you somehow link up this charismatic renewal with the bizarre liturgical yes. dancing stuff and the liturgical abuses. Mm. Um, is it salvageable? Do you really want to go back to the 70s and 80s when this thing was exploding? Should it look different today? Should we tr be trying to recreate it? You see what I'm saying, I think. Yeah, that's fine. Um, <laughs> how do I meet that man? <laughs> well, I think um, uh, in those early days, we were very, very much, as you say, like enthused and, and full of... Um, uh, tremendous uh, enthusiasm for the Lord. But it's only over years that we've gained the wisdom, really, uh, to know how best to um, minister this grace, really. Um, when I think of the things we sometimes did uh, in our youth ministry and all that sort of thing, I mean, I think that, wow. But we got away with it. But, like, um, but it, was, it was the Lord, but there's always a lot of humanity in, in any yeah. movement of God, isn't there? Yeah. You know, and, and, and especially when there's a, a strong movement of the Lord, as this was, um, a lot of our own um, idiosyncrasies come up, you know, mm -hmm. as well. Uh, and it sort of confuses the whole thing, really. Um, but on the other hand, I don't think we should underestimate... Um, the supernatural, uh, the God's supernatural action, you know, because there's a tendency of some people uh, not to really sort of believe that God can do miracles, for example, yeah. you know, and or that prophecy is real, mm -hmm. or, or um, that you, know, you can lay hands on people, the sick, and they can be healed, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, that uh, those, those sort of manifestations are actually like meant to be almost commonplace in the church, I would believe. Mm -hmm. You know, they certainly were in the early church. And so the charismatic gifts um, should not be sort of squeezed out, you know. And thankfully, at the Second Vatican Council, they actually, uh, in chapter 12 of um, Lum Lumen Gentium, they made it very clear that we're not just a sacramental church, we're a right. charismatic church, right? Yes. And that the two go together. Mm-hmm. Our institution and John Paul II was very strong in, in insisting that we're co-essentially a an institutional church and a charismatic church. That's good, you know, co-essential. Co so it's like this that the charis, charisms are essential, but then of course charisms need to be exercised responsibly, and that was part of the problem: is that <laughs> <laughs> people were getting charisms and exercising them very irresponsibly, right? You know. And, and that can sort of, of course, then present a bad image, yeah. really. Um, and there's been a lot of silly stuff, of course, you know. Um, and um, unfortunately, and unfortunately too, I think a lot of people who experienced that new influx of the Holy Spirit thought, oh, there's no place for me in the Catholic Church, so they went and joined some other group. Mm -hmm. And that was a very sad outcome. But, but overall, though, the fruit has been very good. Okay. You know, and the lives of thousands and thousands of people, or millions of people, really, yeah. have been transformed through this this grace, and it still goes on, but I think in a much more mature fashion. Okay, right. I think we've matured, if if you if I can say that. You yeah. Know, um, in the way that we're ministering the grace, it's, really. Just to make a quick analogy to embarrass mm. myself, it, it's like a ch it's like a child who who encounters something incredible and doesn't know how to handle it. I mean, exactly. I was seventeen when I came to the Lord, or He came yeah. to me, yeah. and I went bananas. <laughs> I remember <laughs> I, I was <laughs> surfing alcohol at a club, so I was working at this club, yes. Yes. and I just was scandalized by the sin and the immodesty. So I f check this out Thursday. You'll love this. You haven't heard this story. So I found the music and I pulled the plug and I just proclaimed about Jesus Christ in the <laughs> middle of this club, just yelling about the good goodness of God. Yeah, right. Yeah. Now, he says he loves me so much. Thank you. Appreciate that. But it's like it's easy. It's, it's so easy to get tired. Oh, it's so easy to get tired. Yes. When I got married, the day I got married, this woman said to me, you get married today? Turn and run. That's what she said, right? 
it's the same idea. It's yes. so easy to be cynical. It's the it easiest is, it? thing in the world. It is, of course. This it life's is. bloody hard and it exactly. knocks you around yeah. and you feel plagued with disappointments. Mm-hmm. And okay. it's, Sorry. it's Sorry. easy to, to look at that young man in the club and be like, what a bloody idiot. <laughs> and maybe he was, but for the Lord. <laughs> and it's probably easy to look at these blooming things that you experience and go, that was nuts. Yeah. And yeah, maybe it was. Like maybe it was, there was an immaturity there. But That's it, right. But it came out of this desire to respond to the Lord, and it turns out the Lord knows how to write on crooked lines and can yes. m- maneuver uh, idiosyncratic whatever people. You know exactly. Yeah. Can I? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, <laughs> was that it? <laughs> Dang. Sorry. <laughs> That's your one question. Gotta go. Um. So, I have. So I converted from Protestantism about 10 years ago. My family did. And Whoops, I'm sorry. Hit this again. Oh, uh, don't worry about it. Um, my, the, my, <laughs> I have, I've had a lot of hesitancy, which has lessened a lot over the last two or three years with the charismatic stuff because uh-huh. I kind of left Protestantism for Catholicism. All uh, right, good. Yeah. And I see it as, and, and I saw it for a long time as like some of the Protestant things that I thought were causing the problems of of self, you know, people deciding for themselves. Yep. It, participating in Catholicism in some way. So what can people who are like leaving Protestantism trying to get away from that kind of stuff mm. still get from the charismatic movement? Or what would you say to people like that? It's really about the Holy Spirit. We can't do without the Holy Spirit. Seriously. <laughs> Let's face it. Uh, and it's really allowing, but we're allowing the Spirit to have His way with us, and allowing Him to bring forward uh, in the the gifts of the Spirit as well. But the primary thing the Spirit does, He wants to transform ourselves. You know, so we can't close down that work of transformation that the Spirit wants. The more we can sort of surrender to the action of the Holy Spirit, the more like our our whole life comes into order. And the fruits can come forward of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, all of that. <clears throat> so that's what the baptism of the Spirit, when you ask me, how do you know whether someone's really baptized in the Holy Spirit? I look to that, the fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, etc. really. And the gifts of the Spirit are, are important for the church, really, but they're not so much for the individual. They're actually for the ministry Mm. You know, the, the charismatic gifts um, are, are really given to us for the sake of the proclamation of the gospel, mm. really. They're not sort of uh, for our own personal edification at all, really. Uh, that's important to remember as well. I, I think if I could yeah. step in here, yeah. I think what I might try to say, just to kind of help somebody become a little more um, open to what <laughs> people like Ralph Martin, who I love, and Father Ken yes. and these other folks mm. who are beautifully charismatic and holy, um, is I'd say, all right, so you yes. love, like, there's always this, this binary thing, isn't there, between like the sacramental and the charismatic elements, yeah, yeah, given yeah, different yeah, names, yeah. right? The institutional, yeah. the whatever, evangelistic. It's all the Holy Spirit. Amen, amen. But you can imagine somebody coming in and they're kind of a little, and they just want the structure and they want it neat and they want it, and that's good. I do too. But yes. then, you, then you, I think one way to kind of introduce them this is to say, does the Lord know you personally? Yes, of course He does. Okay, good. Yes. Is He at work in your life today? What's he doing? Exactly. What's the work he's yeah. doing? And do you believe that or not? Because I think some of us, we don't really believe it. That maybe yes. God sees us as a clump of humanity, but he doesn't see little Matt Fratt over there with all yeah. of his issues and aspirations. Yes. And so if you can go, okay, all right, no, he, he knows me. He wants to work in my life. Yes. All right. So how, how does that look? What's happening? Does he want to do more in your life? Could you perhaps call upon him to do more in your life? And yes. as soon as you start opening that up, you start to get dangerously close to these charismatic folks who seem to have this living relationship with Jesus. And yes. th- that's nothing to be afraid of. And and maybe it's like we're triggering each other. So you've got the people who are tired of the mess and the craziness. Right. And so they lock down and everything's uh, very squared away. But then you get these people who are disenchanted with the lockdown squared everything away because it's too rigid. Yes, that's and they right. end up doing yeah. this, and you see what I mean? We're kind of yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that that's fair enough. <laughs> uh, <it's, laughs> I never quite know what to say to people. It just depends on what their experience is. 
I'd, I'd be interested to talk to Thursday a bit more about their Go experience, but um, I don't know whether he wants to. Oh, he'd love I, to. I'll talk about whatever you want to talk about, Father. <laughs> <laughs> no, so sorry. No, let's do it. But, um, but I'm thinking of your experience, my friend, like um, just um, when you say coming into the Catholic Church, um, did you, what was most important about that for you? The Mass. Praise God. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thank God for that, you know, that you come to the Eucharist. That's beautiful. That was the Mass and the Eucharist. Exactly. That's the high, that's the high, that's the climax of all we're about as, as Catholics, isn't it, really? It's, mm -hmm. the, it's the, the center of our life. Uh, and so that's the high point. But that doesn't exclude the action of the Holy Spirit, doesn't it? In fact, the, it's all about the Holy Spirit. Um, and why would you think that you need to let go of um, the action of the Holy Spirit? I, I don't think it's that. Um, the the things that made me or still slightly make me nervous in the charismatic movement were the the prominence of lay people as um, spiritual ministers oh. um, to the level of and above priests because part of what I didn't like in Protestantism was the everybody... I, I really, the, the hierarchy was something very important to me and I saw that in the Mass. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, well, see, my experience has been different to that, <coughs> that, um, like, it's really important for lay people in the church to be able to live out their baptism and their confirmation as fully as possible, isn't it, really? Mm -hmm. And like someone like yourself, Matt, I mean, you're obviously living it out as... Oh, and please God, I to, am, yeah, I hope. Yeah, mm. and, uh, but then that, that should not in any way be in competition with the, right. the hierarchy at all, really. Work, it's a working together, it's a collaboration. And, and so I've found it really uh, good that lay people are able to sort of take up, take up preaching, lay people can sort of like um, you know, minister in appropriate ways, etc. but not in any way to take the place of the priest, you know. Mm. Um, Was it that people were looking to them for spiritual authority in a way yeah. that they weren't because they've got yeah. some apparent gift, which they may or may, may not possess, but people yeah. look to them anyway? Just like the 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 acceptance of like these people claiming a gift for themselves, and it didn't seem to be like affirmed by the church explicitly in any way. Which is one of the things I found most beautiful about Catholicism was the universalizing of, yeah. in that manner. And then, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. that a lot of a lot of the charismatic groups I saw in the church, you know, years ago, were, you know. Just independent from any priest, or or, um, ah, uh, yeah, I get it. Or, yeah. or 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 if a priest told them maybe slow your roll on that, that priest was like to be, you know, his word was you know not taken to be as authoritative as theirs because they had some type of gift in this matter. Ah, uh, right, yeah, yeah, because that's um, um, that's a shame, really, because uh. The, the gift of the, the hierarchy and, and, and lay people working together uh, with the priests is, is, you know, in this, uh, like a symphony, if you like, you know, is really meant to be, you know, that's how it's... But, but do you see that, um, real quick, do you see that happening today on podcasts? I mean, that you could say the same thing about people are listening to this Catholic oh, it, YouTuber and they're... I think it's, I think that kind of They're not of listening thing, to the, pri the priest or the church, right? Yeah. No, I think it's moving into traditionalism too. Mm. Um, but do you but, see what we're saying? So yeah. if if it's true in one sense that someone's going to someone with apparent charismatic gifts and they're not listening to the church, yeah, it could be true in the other sense that well, church hierarchy, whatever. I'm listening to my yeah. favorite podcaster now. Well, you see, the thing about charismatic gifts is they must always be in submission, in obedience. You know, that's one of the tests of whether mm. it's an authentically uh, charismatic gift. Yeah, you know, or used well. Um, you know, the, the tests are really humility um, and obedience to authority. You know, if, if, if that's not present, then they're disordered, really. Mm. And, and sure, there's been a lot of disorder, I think, you know, over the years. And uh, probably not so much these days, but there certainly has been disorder. 
you know, where um, those things have been in competition in the wrong way. See, yeah. what, what I'm seeing at Franciscan, which kind of came out of this charismatic movement, yeah. is you've got the majority of people up on campus, I would say, if not the majority, of well over 50% of people kneeling to receive Eucharist, w- the women wanting to veil, them wanting a traditional oh, mass. okay, right, yeah. So I'd want to say to Father Dave, as the work gets yes. done on this church here, if we're listening to the Spirit, we shouldn't exclude the possibility of putting in an altar rail <clears throat> and uh, maybe thinking that the Holy Spirit is leading us to this more traditional way of worship. Well, that's a decision that has to be made by them, I guess. Yeah. Isn't it really? Yeah. <laughs> so I can tell him, but... It, um, yeah. Um, but what do you think about that idea, though? Because I, I, I see people saying... Like you, you said you came to Franciscan in 83, what did you say, to yeah. do this thing? And you said mm-hmm. it was different. And yeah. Should we not think that this maturity that may be taking place is leading us into something that looks more traditional than maybe it did in the 70s? Well, I think uh, we take out of our treasure chest what's new and old. You take, for example, our Light to the Nations experience, mm-hmm. which I think you know something about. Yeah, I never um, went, but I've heard great things. Yeah, yeah. And it's basically the Easter liturgy, mm-hmm. the Easter liturgies, the whole of the, the Triduum mm-hmm. uh, from Holy Thursday through uh, Good Friday, Easter Saturday, etc. Now, it's all experience of the liturgies, really. Um, but around that, too, there's other things that are happening where people are camping and they're sort of, it's like it's a pilgrimage event, you know. And some people get to stay inside like me, but most people are <laughs> camping. <laughs> Uh, and um, then we have this wonderful experience of liturgies. And the liturgies are done in faithful, faithful way to the, the, what the church calls us to do in the, in the way we engage in the liturgies. Um, but we, we, we celebrate it in a way that's um, you know, fully you know, praising God and giving God the glory, etc., and letting loose as much as possible um, within the, the liturgical expressions uh, you know, the praise of God. Yeah, you know, and we're not trying to sort of like contain it or hold it back too much. Mm. Um, and it's beautiful. It's, it's like bringing forth with your treasure chest both new and old. So there's this new movement of the spirit in the church to revive the church in these days. I think mm-hmm. you know to renew hearts and to set us free. Uh, but then there's also all of the tradition that's been given to us. It's so rich, you know, and you don't want to lose anything of the rich Catholic. Mm. Tradition. Now, we, uh, that's one example. Another example is like our ordinations. When we have our ordinations, we, we have the liturgy in such a way that you know you you'll have a Latin motet and you'll have some charismatic praise. You, it's a whole slew of stuff going on. It's like it's the old and the new, really, and it's being very faithful though to the liturgy of the uh, you know the, of the church uh, and. Um, so it's having that faithfulness to the liturgy, but at the same time, the a freedom too. You see, because what's interesting about worship, um, you know, when, when there was a Samaritan woman um, met Jesus and Jesus spoke to her and everything, and, um, you know, uh, she started talking about worship, and he said, well, there'll come a time, you know, um, you know you, you, you're worshipping um, on... Um, what, what's the mountain? Oh, I forget on the mountain. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've got, yeah, yeah but, uh, and, and 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 we worship in Jerusalem. But there'll come a time when true worshippers, yeah, will worship in spirit and truth. It won't be on Mount Gerasim or in Jerusalem as such. So that won't be important. What will be important is it's a true worshipper, mm-hmm. not the style of worship, or the, uh, but the true worshipper. So whatever we engage in, whatever way we establish our worship it, it, and rituals, etc., the issue will be how true is the worshipper, you know? Is the, wor- is the worship happening in spirit and truth from the heart? Because oftentimes people can get so caught up in having to get the liturgical rubrics right of one kind or another that the spirit of worship is lost, right? So we always have to be asking for the Holy Spirit to revive our worship. That is worship from the heart, you know? Um, so I think that's the key thing in the whole issue. Whichever way we go about our worship as church, you know? 
And, that, and the other thing is too, I don't think we should be turning the Eucharist into a battleground. Um, but uh, see, the argument from yeah. maybe more my side is that when people who claim to be moved by the Spirit turn it into something that the Second Vatican Council hasn't even called for in Sacrosanctum Concilium, yeah, well, that then it's they good. who are turning that it into the battleground. Yeah, sure. And then there's a reaction to that. And then yeah. the people who are reacting to this, these novelties that are being instituted are the ones who are often attacked as being too rigid or something. Yeah. You see? Yeah. <clears throat> so how we work through that, I don't know. But like, certainly it's not good that it's a battleground. Right. We can agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not good because it's, um, uh, it's the Eucharist. <laughs> Amen. It's, uh, it's so hard, you know. It's the sacrifice of Jesus, and it's what unites us. And the whole purpose of Eucharist is, is like, of course, it's about unity, isn't it? You know that we eat the body of Christ to become the body of Christ, huh? mm -hmm. and so we're made one through the Eucharistic celebration. Uh, that's our. I, I think it was Lewis. I know he was an Anglican, but he said something yeah. to the effect of, you know, when the priest begins tinkering with the liturgy to make everybody feel more at home, the opposite happens. Because we're now just encountering some thing that he's putting together instead of what the church has put together. Yeah. yeah, it's very important, of course, for priests to be moving in the spirit of liturgy rather than just their own spirit. <laughs> <laughs> We've got a bunch of questions here, if you don't mind. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Kyle. You, yeah. We want to read Hollow real quick. Yes. Have you heard of Hollow before? Yeah, yeah. Great. Do people know about it in Australia? They do, I think, but you could certainly... <laughs> it's yeah. an advert. i got to. Yeah. It's required. Yeah, Contractually, okay. actually. <laughs> yeah. Contractually. We have Contract. To. Okay. Feel Hello free. is a fantastic Catholic app. It's the number one downloaded Catholic app on the app stores. Yes. And it, was, it even beat TikTok earlier in the year when people were all excited about establishing a prayer rule. Yes. So we'd recommend you go to Hallo, H-A-L-L-O-W dot com slash Matt. And when you do that and sign up there, just by using that link, you'll get Hallow's app for Hello. free for three months. You'll get the entirety of the app, not just bits and pieces. You can try it out for three months for free. And if you don't like it, you don't have to pay a cent. I use it. We love to play little Bible stories for the kids They uh, to put them to sleep sometimes at night. And it's <laughs> quite good. It's funny. I think like Hallow, I don't know if this is, I think it's good. But like, you know, 10 years ago, if you saw somebody with headphones in the Adoration Chapel, you'd be like, what are you bloody doing? <laughs> Whereas now you're like, ah, hallow. It has this beautiful prayer experiences yes. that'll lead you through. Yeah. Hallow.com slash at. All right. So I haven't read these questions ahead of time. They're coming through as we're sitting here. <laughs> so let's see. Kyle says, Matt, you mentioned the exhaustion that's experienced by serving the Lord. What's the recharge method when you hit that point? I, I might ask you that. Because exhaustion. I, yeah. Yeah. What did, I, what did I what did I say exhaustion? I don't know if I said I'm exhausted, but I, I guess I, I was yeah. talking about it's easy to become cynical. It's yeah, easy right. To... Yeah. Well, I, I go aside uh, every month for two days into solitude. That's really my recharge very much. And the recharge is very simple. It's just coming back to the Lord. <laughs> and being recharged in him and the relationship. So it's like John the Beloved resting against the chest of Jesus, mm. just going aside and just being there, listening to his heart again and opening my heart up to him where it's sort of struggling or, you know, how you can get off centre very quickly and, and not realise you're off centre. Yes. So I sort of come back centred centered again in him. Um, you know, it's the whole thing of, Mary at the feet of Jesus, you know, just absorbing his presence rather than Martha out there working. And, and I mean, Martha's great, and um, but you need that Mary part, don't you, where you're just mm. simply there at his feet and um, so soaking up his presence. So otherwise the relationship gets lost in all the busyness and the, 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 the pressures that are on us, especially of ministry, if, you, if that person is in full-time ministry especially, it's just so hard. Or it could just be the troubles of life, you know, the suffering that you're going through, or <clears throat> just being able to draw aside with the Lord and have that quiet time. Now, not, not everybody, of course, has that um, capacity, I guess, or, or freedom to do that. Uh, I'm thankful I do. I put it, it's the first thing I put into my calendar, 
you know, every month, those two days aside with the Lord, it centers me again in Him, you know. And um, so that's, that's a key thing. Whatever that, however that can be achieved in your life, that's the yeah. way I think. Yeah. I, I would imagine we actually have, it's like prayer, you know. It's, yeah. it's easy to say I don't have time, but if something's yeah. important, we make time. You um, do. We have time yeah. to watch that TV show. We have time exactly. to ingest that podcast, this one. Like we, we find time for things exactly. we love. Exactly, yeah. So that's interesting. I love that. The start of every month you choose those two days. Yeah, that's yeah. beautiful. Yeah, it's, it's, it's critical for me. Otherwise, I think I'd come unstuck. That's yeah. good. I know for, for me, and people are different, but for me, this thing I both love and hate. Oh, yes. The phone. Oh, the phone. So yeah. I leave, I try to leave yeah. it whenever I can at the office along with my computer and just not be on constant yeah. reaction. That's what the yeah. phone makes you. It turns you into a reactionary. Absolutely. You're yeah. always reacting you get chained to it, vibrates really, and absolutely. Yeah. buzzing and beeping. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it's hard to get loose of it too, aren't you? Aren't you? The expectations are very high that you'll have an instant response and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. I'll even say this as some advice for people who run a YouTube channel. Because, you know, we talked about this the other day, Thursday, where it's like, if you keep cranking out content, now that's really good for the channel. It's really good for the algorithm. Yeah. And then you're stuck in this cycle where, yeah. like, well, maybe I don't want to be, who cares if it tanks? Let it tank a little bit. <laughs> what, do I have to be on this treadmill forever? Is that <laughs> yes, the idea? Right. Um, and so not to get caught in that trap, you know, yeah. to, to allow the Lord to be in charge more than the yeah. YouTube algorithm. If he wants someone to see it. Yeah, and he'll yeah. allow them to see it, and you can just step away a little. And that's great, Matt. You have a real heart for the Lord, don't you? I hope so. Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah praise I God. I do. I do. I love you do. him. Yeah, you're you're hungry for God. I love him more today than I ever have. See, that's the big thing, isn't it? That hunger. We have to keep that hunger going. That really thirst for yeah. God. You know, you're earning for more, really. Well, and, it's a, and, and to, to say to the Lord, Lord, I'm not going to wait until I feel like I hunger for you to tell you exactly. that I hunger for you. I hunger for you. I exactly. want you. Help yeah. me to want you more than my morning coffee. Absolutely. Help me. I That's don't. That's a big one. That's a big but one. I do. That's a big one, yeah. That's <laughs> a big one there. <laughs> Help me to want you more than sins. <laughs> Help me to want you more than sin. Yeah. Come, Lord Jesus. Oh, I, never mind. Sorry. Oh, what did you say? Sin. Oh, what's that? What's the, sin? the nicotine pouches oh, I sustain on. You said sin. <laughs> sin too, but two, also yeah. sins. I want sins really bad. <laughs> <laughs> the nicotine. RJ MTK says it seems like a various various forms of acedia are prevalent in people these days. How do you suggest we battle against this in teens? Yeah, I say acedia. Yeah, that's like a, a soft soft, yeah. soft sort of thing. But it's um, the the monks used to find it. Uh, they called it the noonday devil. But they'd be in them. They're supposed to be in their cell, but it gets hot. And so noonday, <laughs> they'd leave what they're meant to be doing. So that sort of thing where knowing what is God's will for you now, because your joy is going to be found in doing God's will, even if it's hard, whatever you're meant to be doing in the Lord. But if you find yourself getting distracted and taken off by other things, it's going to be something that at first will taste good, but it won't really satisfy and free you. That's the Achadia problem, isn't it, really? And um, so it's good to um, keep checking ourselves on that. I think that's part of the reason for that uh, two days, by the way, is um, looking at, well, where have I got distracted, where have I got taken off, you know, because you've got to sort of keep your eyes fixed on the target all the time. And um, otherwise you just deviate a little bit, like an ocean liner or something, you know, if it's sort of, if it's, puts its bearings wrongly on one side of the ocean just by just a fraction but at times the other side will be way out of, mm. out of whack and it's like that we can't let ourselves get deflected too much you know and it's the enemy's his, his tactic is to deflect us really yeah not necessarily to wipe us out of the game but eventually we get wiped out of the game but initially it's just sort of deflected sufficiently so that we're not doing what we're meant to be in god's plan doing uh, we're caught up in something else, mm. uh, and 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 so that's sort of um, the noonday devil. Uh, it's a tricky one, really. It, it's uh, mm. he comes disguised as an angel th- of light. You I know? think Aquinas defines uh, sloth as a sort of a, a despondency in the face of spiritual goods, something to that effect. Yeah, we're called yeah. to something, but it's too arduous or something. Right. Okay. Yes. Um, 
I, yeah. I, uh, I, since this person asked about teens in particular, I think they said teens. Sorrow teens? about spiritual good. Yeah. What's that? Sorrow of, oh, oh. Sorrow about spiritual good. And it's, I can't say that word, facetiousness of the mind, which neglects to be good. Facetiousness. Fastidious? I don't know. Um, I don't know for teens, like, I think my, my son, who's 16, I yeah. think if you pulled him aside and you asked him and I didn't, he'd probably agree that it was a great thing that his father never bought him a smartphone. And I yeah. think that these, if one option is, I'm not mandating right. this for the entirety of the church, huh. one option would be to homeschool your kids in a good Catholic community with other beautiful, crazy, wild families and mm. do not allow your children to have <clears throat> smartphones and allow them to have extremely limited access to screens and the internet. Do not allow them at all on social media. And then I think that, will help a great deal with this um, acedia stuff because you, right. we we get so exhausted by entertainment. We do. Every August I tend mm. to, we'll see what happens this August, I take the month off of the internet in oh, August okay. from start to the end. I give well away done. my phone, I give away my computer. Well done. But something very interesting happens and that is I actually crave entertainment. It right. sounds funny, and I know yeah. it's not the goal of giving up entertainment is to start craving it, but I actually want it. I'm like, I'd love to watch a movie. Yeah, right. But I don't think that anymore because all day long I find that I'm uh, this tweet, that Facebook post, this quick YouTube video. It's like I'm gorging myself with little tidbits of entertainment. It'd be yes. like if you ate all day, you don't want to yeah. eat dinner. But that sort of stuff kills contemplation, you know. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty clear now that that's – probably the biggest obstacle to developing a contemplative spirit, which I think all of us should develop, not just monks or whatever. We all need to have that sort of contemplative heart where we're in love with the Lord. But we lose touch of that, you know, by all of this stimulation all the time. We're, yeah. We're, boom, 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 we're stimulated. We're overstimulated, you know. That's right. And it, it, it kills the heart. Amen. You know? Really? Yeah, I could talk forever on this. I won't. I always talk about this. So oh, right, I it's better thing. stop because people uh, get okay. sick of it. Yeah. Just <laughs> bingo. <laughs> bingo. Uh, he wants a bingo card where uh, when I say uh, things, I always say okay. that. Uh, Is there a piece of advice, Kyle asks, that you wish a younger Father Ken would have received or got but didn't listen to? So as a younger priest, what advice do you wish someone gave you? Or maybe you were given it and you didn't listen to it. What do you wish you listened to? Does oh, that make okay. sense? It's a good does, question. It does make sense, I guess, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the advice, yes. So for me, real quickly, yes. I, as a younger married man, I wish yes. the advice someone gave to me or advice I listened to was yes. implant yourself into a vibrant Catholic community. Find it, get there yes. as soon as you can because yes. life's bloody hard and you're going to need brothers yeah. and sisters. Yeah. Because all the other things that I could give you advice about, young Matt Fred, that you won't take right now, will yes. be much easier if you were just in a community of people who love you and are helping you. But that, that's, that's good. What I, but what advice would... Yeah. I think for me, it would be probably, as a young priest, I think I was too worried about my performance. Uh, I wanted to perform well, and I was matching myself against other guys who seemed to be doing so much better and, and sort of comparing myself and my own worth and value... Uh, was sort of suffering as a result and, and I was too much focused on myself and I probably needed the advice to let that go. Uh, does that make sense? But would have you received it? Because I'm sure if somebody That's said that to you question. back then, it's not like you would have went, yeah. I've never thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> you would have went, well, yes, of course. I, I, you would have nodded sagely to that advice, but yeah, listening to it, it's hard, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. That's true. Yeah. But it sounds like you were able to receive it when the Holy Spirit allowed you. That's true. Yeah. That's yeah. That that that's when things changed, more than ever, for sure. Yeah. What advice? Because you're twelve and a half, Thursday. I'm twenty four. Sorry. What advice do you wish as a twenty four year old man that maybe you were given? Let's say I don't know, sixteen, fifteen. That. that you... Oh, at fifteen or sixteen. Sure. Or whenever. Hmm. It's a tough one. I think I wish somebody had set because one of the struggles i always had in education was that i 
was smart enough in high school to not have to try, so I didn't learn how to try. Uh-huh. And then when I got to college, I didn't know how. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So I think maybe not so much like a single piece of advice, but I think I wish that somebody would have taught me how to learn or how to work on education. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't change it now because if I had gotten my education, I wouldn't be here. So Fair enough. Mm. Kiwi JJ five 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 six four two probably not their real name says, <laughs> Father, are you experiencing the same trans craziness in Australia? And do you have any thoughts or suggestions on how we can respond? Transgender. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, we are. You're probably that. Yeah. throwing up rainbows at this point. It's getting stuffed into you from every angle, isn't it? In Australia during this month, I remember coming at us. Yeah, that's true. Um. It's a hard one, I think, because on the one hand, we have to sort of meet things compassionately. There's a lot of very confused people, but we have to speak the truth. And um, I think, um, so I, I haven't, to tell you the truth, I haven't come up with, against it uh, personally in my own ministry at this point in time, um, but I'm reading a lot about it and hearing people talk about it and that sort of stuff. But uh, I haven't actually had to sort of like sit down with someone mm-hmm. and work things through. So I haven't had that first-hand experience. I think that, uh, but, I, but I, I would hope that when that moment comes, I will be able to sort of meet it with compassion. I think compassion is really important because I think there's a lot of confused people, hugely mm-hmm. confused, you know. And, um, and it's a cultural confusion, really. That's the problem, isn't it? It's not as if it's, and, and so all sorts of crazy expectations have come up around, around this whole issue of gender. And um, so, and, and I think there's, with, it's possibly with young people, there's like a, uh, they, they, they're taking it from one another, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and it's a huge the amount. social contagion so, element. So, yeah. You got it. Social contagion. That's what I was looking for the word. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, that's a big issue, you know. And um, it's 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 tough because you've got those who are confused, and then you've got evil corporations that are trying to brainwash people. And yeah, right. it's, it's sort of like pornography. If yeah. I sat across from a man who tells me he looks at pornography, of course, I, yes. I, you want to share. I know the fight. I know it's tough compassion yeah, yeah. Mm. but then if i've got people pumping it into my living rooms on purpose exactly yeah. then yeah. well the judgment of god is a real thing and hell is eternal yeah, true yeah it's um it's really tragic for the society and the, the level of confusion is so deep that it, it i'm not sure how to meet it yeah quite frankly well i pray um, that priests and bishops in australia will speak manfully against it with compassion yeah this truthfulness we, yeah, we, we right. so need the church to help lead the way here yeah because we have the true anthropology yeah i think it's, it's the second vatican council when god is forgotten the creature becomes unintelligible the bishops of australia have put something out for education institutions um it's for schools you know how to meet it with in the schools is it good it's okay. It's okay, but it's uh, it, it's hard. Um, I think they're trying to sort of like accommodate um, in some way, and that won't work. And I, it's hard to know it how, how it should respond. These yeah. people, and by people I mean those pushing this ideology, are unfriendable. They're not interested. It's a zero sum game. We yeah. have to be bloody manly i think in our ref, ref, refutation I'm, I'm, of this I'm, I'm worried though for the the young people who are caught up in this that, yeah that they're the ones i i i feel for because yes they're and, the and their parents are this. terribly uh confused etc and uh, there's a beautiful story recently that i read of a parent who had um, you know worked with her uh, t- teenage daughter and the daughter wanted to change and that sort of stuff and she really kept working with her working with her and and finally, they've got, she's come through it, you know. But so often that people just give in, right? And that's to the, to see, the lie. That's where that's we, the problem. That's where we don't want church leaders and priests and bishops sacrificing truth on the altar of niceness. Where yeah, you know, yeah. parents need to be told. You know, you've been you're supposed to love your child. Yeah, not allow someone to butcher them. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's that's important, and and. Um, 
But then when you see, when you're in the middle of the, the issue, I, I haven't actually had to confront it face to face yet, but when you're in the middle of the someone's struggle, um, trying to walk with them through that, yeah. it's, it's, I, I don't know how we're going to do it, really. Because you can't just sort of beat people over the head and say this is all wrong, but we have to meet them, but then uh, try and help people to be you know, led out of that over time, you know, it's, um, so, so I'm, I'm not really an expert in this area, but sure. I, you know, well, I would recommend it since you said you're reading on this, Yeah, something I'd recommend you take a look at if you're interested or those who haven't seen this is my interview with Jason Everett, uh, who's a fantastic right. fella who speaks a lot on chastity and he's done a deep dive into this issue yeah, yeah, yeah. and this fella threads the needle in a way that I haven't seen done between mm-hmm. truth and just compassion. Yeah, yeah. And so mm. I interviewed him a couple of months ago now, Jason Everett, mm. E-V-E-R-T. He wrote a book on this issue. So, And that was like a two and a half hour chat. It's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. He knows a great yeah, deal yeah. about it. Mm. Uh, thank you. Okay, Carmen. Oh, You know what I don't like? Yeah, I know what you don't like. What You tell him what I don't like. He doesn't like it when... <laughs> They say anonymous in it, but it does say it in the... I said their name, and then they said anonymous, please. Now what do I do with that? <laughs> oh, you've used <laughs> yeah, it. So that's what oh, I don't like. No. We should just start, like, anonymizing all the questions, I guess we honestly. should. It doesn't matter. Can, Can you ask? I'll, ask I'll ask a couple of other comments in the world, let's face it. Yeah, yeah, I'll ask a couple of questions, and then we'll get to that one, so we oh, don't okay. know who but says let's so. anonymize the yeah. rest yeah. of no them. No one else is being, yes. All right, Can you ask the one right above that, though? Because I feel like that would make a good clip. <laughs> sure. <laughs> in the almost half century that you, Father, have been a priest, yes. what are the most distinct differences you see in new priests versus the priests you were in formation with? Well, that's an interesting question. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. We started off with um, uh, 28 in our class in formation mm. um, in the Dustin Priesthood. And six of us were ordained, mm. right? So there was a big drop off. Uh, so that's the first thing to notice. But um, what's the difference? I I I think um, it depends. You see, on who you're talking about. I can talk about how our priests. Our <laughs> priests are very different. Are they today uh, than they were back in the? Oh, different from the other. Yeah. Well, different in the sense that we, um, um, you know, obviously we move in under the grace of the renewal, etc. So that's very different. From, from others, from some. Um, but I think um, it varies. See, our, our priests would um, be much more aware of who they are, much more uh, aware of um, their own weaknesses and uh, their struggles and willing to seek help in that regard, especially in human development. Like I think we've put a lot of effort into human development mm. Um, not thinking that the Holy Spirit is going to solve everything in a supernatural way, mm-hmm. but rather that human development is, you know, grace builds on nature. Yeah, huh? yeah. So we've done like a lot of Like the Holy of Spirit's omnipotent, but you need to still brush your teeth, <laughs> right? The, <laughs> exactly. in, in, a, in, instead of yeah, just so praying I, for good dental hygiene. So <laughs> I think that's been very important. So working with guys so that, um, you know, they'll be able to sort of relate well with people and not, not be over the top of people in a harsh way but also have good psychosexual development. And, and having that within um, a covenant community has been very helpful because we're, look, we're talking with lay people all the time, we're sharing with lay people, we're in and out of their homes, and, and it's sort of like they're our friends. And, and so the young guys who are being formed, they're not just being formed in an isolated sort of way, but they're connected in with, with lay people and it gives us sort of a, a much healthier sort of a climate and mm-hmm. environment. You know, where you can be loved and that sort of thing and, and love with, in a sort of a healthy way rather than sort of just be isolated and feeling frustrated because nobody loves me mm. or I've got nobody to love, that sort of thing. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's, that makes a big difference for a well-rounded sort of uh, yeah. priestly uh, presence, really, because celibacy, of course, is a big issue, isn't it, really? And being able to live that out in mm. a rich and good and wholesome sort of way. Um, so that's a, sure. um, one thing I could mention. All um, right. Another question here. Um, 
This person says, I have a little experience with the MGLs, in particular the sisters, such a joyful group, especially St. Therese. Mm -hmm. Sister Therese, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't be canonizing her yet. They hold a biennial Easter youth celebration. Having witnessed the celebration, it reminded me of a Hillsong celebration somewhat, but a Catholic version. <laughs> Can Father please explain how this Easter pilgrimage came to be? It's called Light to the Nations. <laughs> and then this person says, P.S., such a tough gig being a Catholic in Canberra, the government just took back the Catholic hospital there. We are fighting for it. Yes. Right. So that's the Light to the Nations, huh? Yeah. yeah. That started because um, I'd been in France and I saw the... Um, what the French community was doing uh, with a pilgrimage. And I thought, wow, we should have a pilgrimage. So we went to the Redemptorist Monastery in Geelong and um, asked whether we could sort of have a pilgrimage event there um, for the Easter. And I wanted very much, it to be very much something that was, um, you know, drawing from the best of the Catholic tradition and liturgical tradition and then also um, the, under the experience of the charismatic renewal so that was the idea of the of and to have a pilgrimage that would um you know draw people together mm. uh, and uh, and celebrate that right the, the highest point of our our, our liturgical experience of, as church knowing that do you still do uh, that every easter we do it so. every second easter ah, okay um and um yeah we still do it nice. it's a it's a wonderful experience and um so yeah, that's how it came about. It, I guess it was a vision the Lord gave me to sort of, uh, and of course the community's taken up as mm. it's not my work, it's the community's work. Yeah. Um, I guess a personal question here, since you've been, what do you call yourself, the moderator of the MGLs or what would the Yeah, moderator I used to be until <laughs> Grand Poobah, yes I was. I have been from the very beginning until yeah. November last year. What's it like letting your hands off the, the wheel, as it were? I mean, yeah, seeing this thing, giving birth to it, dealing with it. I mean, yeah. at some point having to give it to the Lord and allow other, you know, weak men, like we're all weak. Yeah. Uh, well, I've been very grateful because we've had a beautiful succession plan that actually worked. <laughs> Imagine um, that. Yeah, so <laughs> it seems like it's working anyway, yeah. that there's a new leadership in place. And um, they were elected, but we did a lot of preparation, and and, um, and that's going so well. We have a new leader, Steve Fletcher. He's a great guy and been with with me from very early years. Oh, good, and um, has a strong vision for keeping going what what has been begun, and and they're very intent upon the charism not being in any way diminished. Mm. So that anything to do with the charism, they'll come and talk to me about. Um, so I'm sort of um, very grateful that in my lifetime, I've been, this has actually been able to happen, yeah. the transition, because that's the weakest moment yeah. in a congregation or any new new movement, really. The weakest moment is when the you know the key leader uh, has to step aside or dies or something like that. And yeah. um, so it's so far, the signs are really good Praise that God. we're we're going forward and they're trying to level out the leadership because I was doing too much. Yeah. Uh, but that's because I was the initial guy, mm -hmm. but um, but now it's being leveled out, and um, so I'm I'm grateful for that. And so, what's it like for me personally? Well, uh, first of all, it's that gratitude. Secondly, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, next, in one <laughs> oh, sense, okay, I'm sorting that out. That's part of what I'm doing at the moment. Is just sort of searching mm -hmm. as to what will be the best way I can contribute, and that will be uh, un, in obedience anyway. I'm in obedience to the new man, so... New bishop? Is that who you mean? It's not the bishop, no, no. Who's well, the new man? Oh, I see, of course, the yes, angels, right. Yeah. Yes. So we have a, a new leader, so ah. I'm, I'm in obedience to him. And um, Could he send you into solitude to pray for the rest of your days? He could send me to anywhere and I'd have to obey. Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure it'll be dialogical. You'll get a taste of your own medicine at this point. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, we have a very dialogical understanding of obedience. You know, it is obedience ultimately, but we talk through what's happened, placements and that sort of stuff yeah. before actually sending someone somewhere. Yeah. Good. Praise mm. God. I am so, I love you, Father, and I'm so grateful for oh, you. Thank you. Yeah, I've known you for... You know, we've had probably interactions that were so brief, you've probably forgotten them, but they meant a lot to me. 
Okay. And so you've, you, you have in little ways kind of encouraged me and your prayerfulness has been a great witness to me. And I'm just, I'm, this is an honor to be able to sit down with you. So Thank thanks you. for agreeing to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're very proud of you in Australia, you know. Mm. We know you, a lot of people watch you in Australia. Okay. Yeah, you've got a big following. Oh, pray and, for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so you're doing great work. And mm. Matt, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's great. You're one of our uh, fine exports, you know. We'll, we'll see how long that lasts. <laughs> um, Father, I've put a link to your uh, your MGL website Thank you. Below, is there anything else you'd like to point people to? I know this the, book. The I've fire. loved this book so yes. much. So for those, yes. I, I when I came, you know, you want to grab it? So yeah. It's closer. Well, <clears throat> it's out of focus all the way back there. But see, I would, but it's not for sale right now. Yeah, because this beautiful book is about to come back into reprint, though, isn't it's, it? Yeah, it's about to come back. This come, book was such a blessing to me, yeah. and I pick it up every couple of years, and I'm so blessed. Even if I just read three, four chapters, I'm so blessed by it. Yeah, we're publishing it on Amazon, so it'll it'll come forward again. Please let me know when it's yeah, out, yeah, so I yeah, can thanks. promote it. Yeah, good. Okay, it's coming out again. Um, and uh, I've done other books, of course, as well. You know, like. Uh, <laughs> God help us. <laughs> I, well, what, what can we point people to? I mean, you have a, don't, don't the MGLs have a YouTube channel or? We've got, um, what have we got there? I, I did give it to you. Oh, did um, you? Thursday. Did yeah. you give it to Thursday or I Melody? Did, yeah. <laughs> Thursday's looking at me like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> but we'll put some links up so that yes. people I'll put them up get connected I'll, with you. I'll put the links up. Yeah, that'd, that'd be great. And if yes. anyone is discerning priesthood and would like to maybe come and visit you, how does that work? Works really well. Just to come, uh, come <laughs> and see. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just come and see. Yeah. yeah. Just to make contact um, on the website or whatever, and um, or with me personally, because I'm still doing a lot of that sort of work. Mm. And um, yeah, they can come and visit and just um, check us out. Good. We do come and see sort of things. Well, you did one yourself, didn't you? I came to one of those. Yeah, and I had a great time. Oh, well, we failed. Yeah. You did <laughs> fail. No, no, you didn't fail. Uh, you know, you told me a good story about when you, uh, after you decided to become a priest, I, w- I won't say the story, I'll let you do it, when you went and told your dad. Oh, yes. Do you yes. want to share that? Or? <laughs> you don't have to say everything. But. No, that was funny because I, I it all happened in a day. I think I mentioned that, didn't I? This is how we began the podcast. Yeah. yeah you were talking about Yeah, we began with that, yeah. yeah. And um, so then I had to go and tell my parents. And they lived a bit further away, so I hitchhiked out to there where they were, and um, they didn't know why I was home because, <laughs> uh, and um, so uh, we had dinner, dinner together, and then Dad used to go outside and he'd sit on a, a, a bench outside and just look at the stars, you see, and have a cigarette, and. Um, so I thought, well, I better tackle him first. The dad wasn't a Catholic; he was a, what he called a Calathumpian. That means like a nothing. Oh. And uh, but he really was a Methodist. He'd go on on sometimes at Christmas. So anyway, I'll t- tackle him first. So I went out there and I see see his cigarette, and I said, "Dad, um, I've got something to tell you." He said, "What's that, son?" I said, "I've decided to become a priest." <laughs> And he let out an expletive, which I probably can't say here. <laughs> it's Australian expletive. <laughs> say what you like. And the cigarette dropped. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, I thought I'll leave him there. And I went, <laughs> I'll retreat I went, backwards into the house. I went in and told, told mum, and she started, te- you know, Captain Mum, I'm tearing, I'm losing my son. And so she's having a little cry. And then um, dad comes in. He thought about it. He said, son, if you're going to be a priest, be a bloody good one. That's yes. lovely. Yeah. I love Catholic so I got, dad advice. That was it. That was like the father's blessing. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I, I love Australian dad advice. <laughs> I've shared this before. When I, when I first told my dad, who wasn't much of a practicing Catholic, that I decided to propose marriage to Cameron, yeah. I shared, showed him the ring. And you know, my dad wasn't raised a Christian. Yes. And sometimes the truest things come out of the mouth of people who don't have the christian language to use. Yeah, yeah. So he said, well... You just make sure you don't be bloody jumping in and out of bed with different Sheilas. You'll be faithful to her. <laughs> that was the advice I got. Isn't that wonderful? That's a good That's advice. advice. Straight <laughs> advice as far as advice goes. Straight up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. So I tried to be a bloody good one. Yeah. That is good. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I, 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 I want to start inviting people to give their lives to Jesus more explicitly, Father. So as we yes, wrap up here, yes, yes. would it be okay if I asked you to look into this camera yeah. and speak to whoever's watching 
no. they'd love to. To help them and help me, I'll pray along with them, give yeah. their life for the first time to Jesus Christ or for the yes. thousandth, you know. Okay. So, yeah, so I think it's really important for us to just turn to the Lord, to know the great love that he has for you. You may not be able to feel that love. You may not be able to um, experience <coughs> it at this moment. But we know that Jesus hung on the cross for each one of us. And when he was raised <coughs> up on that cross, it was so that you could have salvation. You know, he has pierced through for our, our faults and you know, crushed for our sins. On him lies the punishment that sets us free. And by his wounds we are healed. So just to invite you to look to Jesus on the cross in, in your mind to be thinking of Jesus crucified or maybe before a crucifix that you have in your room or wherever you are. Just look to him and gaze upon him as the one who has loved you and given himself completely for your sake, the one who has uh, sacrificed himself for you, the one who uh, now is present to you as the risen Lord. And look upon him in your mind's eye and just simply to repeat after me what what the words, these words. Lord Jesus, I commit myself to you. I commit myself. I thank you that you are my saviour. I thank you that you are my saviour. I acknowledge you as my Lord. I acknowledge you as my Lord. I give to you my past. I give to you my past. My present. My present. And I entrust to you my future. And I entrust to you my future. My life is in your hands. My life is in your hands. Cleanse my heart by your precious blood. Cleanse my heart by your precious blood. Grant me your spirit. Grant me your spirit. May I live for you, Lord. May I live for you, Lord. May I love you with all my heart. May I love you with all my heart. May my life be yours. May my life be yours. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Padre. Thanks for coming. Praise the Lord. This is good indeed. Thank you very much. Good. Sorry about the noise there at the end, guys. It's <laughs> Dean Martin Day. Dean Martin, it's Dean Martin so Festival funny. taking place outside. <laughs> it's Dean Martin that? Day. There's a parade. No, you could hear all of it. That's why I got up and closed the door. I was like, <laughs> well, you could hear it. That was so funny right at that moment. We pray for the repose of Dean Martin's soul. Maybe that's what we're trying to, they're trying to communicate these. <laughs> that was so funny. Yeah. Anyway, for the podcast listeners, that's what that noise was. We yeah. apologize. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God bless. Thanks.